Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for a few more people to enter from the waiting room and we'll launch. All right. Good good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to the October 14th, 2021 Wildland Urban Interface and Statewide Wildfire Risk Mapping Rules Advisory Committee. That's a, a mouthful. Uh, you have on your screen the agenda today, which we will cover in a moment. Uh, and before Tim gives us updates, uh, Les, Roger, and Kyle are going to start us off with a rendition of Amazing Grace. So, gentlemen, please go ahead and on my No? Okay. <laughs> Les, uh, you start. <laughs> I'll, I'll support you, buddy. <laughs> uh, 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 okay, darn it, the heck. All right, Tim, updates from ODF. What's new in the world of ODF? Good morning, everyone. I uh, just wanted to share a, a few updates with you this morning. Um, reminder, the uh, the board will be hosting a, a special meeting on the 20th, where they'll be uh, take, uh, reviewing the uh, uh, the uh, public comments um, and the hearing officer's report, and then uh, um, voting on the um, wildland urban interface definition uh, rule as presented by the department. So that'll be the 20th of October next week. Um, along with that as well, as, um, as you know, throughout these, uh, these uh, past few meetings, we've uh, had uh, active participation from the board. We had three uh, board members on the Wildland Urban Interface uh, original RAC 1, um, Chair Kelly um, and board members uh, Justice and Beamling. Um, and then we also had uh, board member chambers and Chair Kelly on the uh, uh, statewide risk map. So with them uh, coalescing through this process um, and making and uh, with the board list actively listening in and, uh, and joining the Rules Advisory Committee, uh, uh, listening into that process, uh, we've um, run into uh, having a few too many board members in one meeting with that. So uh, um, our board member Doomling will be uh, um, listening in afterwards at the, with the YouTube videos and not uh, live um, on the, uh, on the, on the uh, meetings here. So we'll be... Uh, um, but we like to thank them for their, as you all know, the time commitments and the uh, participation within these meetings as uh, uh, takes a lot of commitment and just shows the commitment of the Board of Forestry and, the, and uh, for them with this process as well and the participation. So I'd like to thank them for their, their continued time and efforts as we uh, move through the rulemaking process and them uh, actively participating. Thanks, Tim. Um, let's go over the agenda so we're all on the same page. Um, we will um, discuss uh, the, the work plan. Thank you for your feedback there. And Tim will give you some responses to give you an idea of where, where we've been and where we are and where we're going. Uh, based on uh, requests from our last meeting um, for a glossary and acronyms and so-called one pager with the magic terms defined. Um, OSU and ODF have done a tag team presentation on that. And I'm going to look to Derek with ODF to say, is that, have you had an opportunity to put that on the website yet, buddy, or is that forthcoming? The, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was uh, trying to take roll. The uh, last time's video is not yet up, but the roster is on the website. And how about the glossary and acronyms? The glossary and acronyms are not up there yet. They will be there later today. Thank you. Thank you. And then maybe when you have time, you could put that, the, um, we can put the link in the chat and we'll take it from there. Uh, what we're going to do uh, between 9.30 and 10.10 10 is follow up on the items we discussed at last time, uh, we got um, uh, some, some great uh, input feedback um, in the interim on how to define our friend vegetative fuels and how to define wildland fuels. And we'll go over that and see if we can land the plane on those two uh, definitions. 
Then we'll move um, uh, to item six, which is at what level should fuel loading be measured? And this gets into what the definition of fire season. We'll move on uh, uh, to number seven, should interim disturbances, read here, large wildfires be captured? And we'll then uh, wrap it up with, should the uh, risk class thresholds be set as a value or a percentage? Um, the action uh, items above are, are just that. We'll do our usual protocol and, and take our pulse poll to see where we're at. Item number five here, the noon to 1240, agenda item is informational only. We don't anticipate taking any polls. It's to um, give you an opportunity to hear what OSU and ODF have been doing in the interim and, and give you some uh, food for thought. There'll be uh, the opportunity for public comment and uh, we'll land the plane with any process check-in and next steps if needed. So that's an overview of the uh, agenda. Uh, the usual reminding everyone about your instructions. So if you are a RAC member, you're going to cover over your uh, wonderfully photoshopped picture and right click and you're going to change your name to RAC, all caps RAC, followed by your name and then an acronym for your organization. Uh, you know how to raise the hand using the Zoom reaction uh, uh, feature. And that's the guy with uh, a little smiley guy there and usually in the lower right of your screen. Uh, same uh, for uh, alternates, if you could be Alt-RAC, Alt-RAC, your name and organization, that would be great with the usual friendly reminder that one vote per organization. So welcome feedback from everyone, be you a RAC member or an, an alternate. But when it comes time to voting, uh, self-select um, the person on your team that will say one, two, three, yay, nay, um, what have you. Um, observers, please keep your camera off. That allows um, the ODF team and OSU and the facilitator here, me, to see your smiling faces of the RAC members so I can get you in the queue in a timely fashion. Uh, members of the public, of course, can visit the website um, or email uh, us. All those um, documents will be rolled up and be part of the record. Um, things will be available on ODF's YouTube channel um, after the meeting, and um, there it is. Uh, the usual RAC charter commitments, and this is basically um, be tough on the, uh, the problem and, and soft on the people. The tenor and tone should be that of exploration uh, versus debate, and uh, you guys have been doing a, a phenomenal job with that, uh, so thank you. So that's kind of the overview of, of the agenda. The, um, we do have uh, under the next agenda item, which is materials and meeting responses, um, ODF had the opportunity to, uh, to look at the updated roster list, what have you. And that was sent out late, late last night, just when you thought it was, um, uh, safe to turn your computers off. You get another email from me. And that list, um, it, uh, the master member list is now on the screen. If you um, see any corrections or typos or wordos or you've added or subtracted people, just please put that in the chat. And if you don't have the opportunity in the moment, we certainly understand and an email um, uh, would be uh, just fine. And we apologize for misspelling um, or uh, OSU, Erica Fisher's uh, last name. And uh, of course, she's not with the extension program. She's with the actual uh, full meal deal university and uh, we'll make those corrections. So that's, those are the logistics um, but I'll turn it over to Tim to see if he has anything you'd like to add um, uh, to this portion of the agenda. 
uh, with the with the roster and the combinations. Uh, appreciate folks uh, um, turning in the uh, their uh, alternates and uh, us being able to get those added. So we'll continually uh, update the uh, as we coalesce the uh, email lists and uh, for materials. So uh, if you're not if you think you're supposed to be getting something and not getting something, please let us know, and we'll make sure that you're on the uh, that you're uh, fully integrated in, um, and also with any. Uh, alternatives that you may or alternative uh, folks you may need to have included as well so thank you for that next up is uh, uh, the updated work plan as I mentioned and you are aware you had an input opportunity um, uh, a while back as to sub questions uh, to the questions that have been teed up in the work plan and also comments on sequencing and so I'll turn it over to Tim to give you a quick update on what is the state of that uh, uh, appreciated input. So uh, again, appreciate uh, the input on that. That was a large uh, work plan and uh, recommendations and thoughts to walk through. So for everyone who uh, put the, had that uh, committed the time and effort to uh, um, adding adding feedback to that, really appreciate that. Um, as well with uh, reintegrating all of that in back into the process um, at the uh, for the where we're currently going with the work plan and the questions for today, the uh, feedback for that we received for those particular uh, numbered questions will be uh, um, in directly integrated into the uh, um, addressed as we walk through the uh, um, presentation of the topics and, uh, and uh, the uh, the questions posed. The uh, uh, further reordering um, probably take us uh, about a. Uh, Two more meetings to get the, any of the reorders uh, integrated in, um, so we can uh, work them into the plan and as we continually review them. So we'll be seeing some some adjustments as we uh, continually review and integrate in all of the uh, great comments and suggestions that have been uh, that have been turned into the department, and we'll uh, continually uh, uh, move integrate them into the recommendations, or at least or, and uh, also make sure that uh, any comments are also addressed. Um, when uh, the recommendation is posed to the Rules Advisory Committee as well. Thanks, Tim. And Erica, now I see you on my screen. At least I'm sure you were here before. Please take the congratulatory bow for your good work on the glossary and acronyms. So thank you for that. Um, so what's up next? Uh, this is the refinement portion um, of the discussion. Um, what we uh, made a lot of progress on during the uh, uh, last meeting are, are questions three and four. And we're going to um, initially take them as a package. Um, uh, ODF and OSU will respond and it will go through the questions for clarification and the usual uh, feedback. And then we will take that pulse poll. So on uh, vegetative fuels, uh, we had uh, five of you fully supported the new proposal uh, that ODF put forward. Five of you uh, agreed with it as stated, but would prefer modifications. And four of you uh, did not find it uh, worthy of your support. On the, uh, and then Tim will summarize your feedback if you added two or three as part of the presentation. And with regard to wildland fuels, uh, three of you gave it a one, seven of you gave it a two, and four of you uh, gave it a three uh, and provided your comments, which I'll now turn it over um, uh, to F Tim et al. Uh, to tell us what's going on. So with, uh, with the uh, reviewing the, uh, the chat and all the notes from the uh, Previous meeting, uh, we were discussing between questions three and four. What we were discussing as a whole was the the fuel bed of the of the entire state. So, as we uh, with that concept in mind, we were trying to break into two areas: vegetative fuels and um, the uh, and wildland fuels. And I'm going to admit we missed in the uh, looking at the agenda. There's a word missing in the vegetative fuels, which uh, of not wildland fuel. There was a Good, based on the conversation from our last meeting of trying to have a distinction. Um, I'm looking for a second because all of a sudden everyone just froze on my camera. Um, the, uh, there we go. The, uh, 
wildland fuels are supposed to be distinctively different. So it should read the wildland fuels are not considered to be part of vegetative fuels to have that distinction between the two. Um, for the vegetative fuels, it was removing the word land. Um, that was uh, consistent that it was uh, um, uh, having a geograph, essentially that's the area as opposed to what's on that area. So the, uh, that was removed and uh, turned into the uh, referring to the, the plants that are that are available um, and tying it to uh, their potential to have uh, a fire hazard. The, um, for the wildland fuels, it was um, tying it to the, uh, the natural, the, um, the theme of it being natural areas or undisturbed that are uh, not, that are um, not developed. So those were the two concepts uh, that were wrapped into for the uh, definition for wildland fuels. So that's how those are um, the context that was taken for those to, uh, um, to bring those uh, uh, updates um, as well for the recommendations to get, uh, capture those definitions and to be able to uh, capture the full fuel bed between those two terms and uh, try to establish a, a line um, between in, in that uh, span of what, bed, what uh, the fuel bed is within the state. Um, there, was, uh, there was comments about um, trying to, uh, um, that uh, crops and such should not be portions of the uh, of fuel. However, crops grow on cropland and that is uh, getting close to the uh, exclusion of a, of a group of land as well. So uh, it was hard, it was difficult to um, reason to remove a certain vegetation type because it's tied directly to a geographic area and the statute does, does not give us the wiggle room to be able to, to do that. Um, it's pretty explicit to not exclude a land class. And uh, so that was, um, you know, feed, that uh, comment was received, um, but it was uh, difficult to integrate into the, uh, into the recommendation for a definition. Any other comments from uh, uh, OSU on either of these definitions? All right, I'll, I'll facilitate a uh, rack conversation uh, with the reminder that um, th these are general statements designed to get the overall sense of what these will look like. Eventually, when we, uh, they will be turned into a package with more refined OAR-like language with Latin terms and, and, and related sorts of, uh, of OAR requirements that will be presented uh, as a package. And so there'll be that opportunity at the end to look at everything because of the interconnectivity of all these definitions and issues. So I'll open up the queue for uh, comments. And first up to bat is Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Sam. And, and Tim, I'm sitting here in my office in King City. I'm about 200 yards from a Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue substation. Uh, my office has grass, shrubs, uh, some arborvita, uh, a couple of fir trees, an oak tree, uh, all of which I think fall within your definition of vegetative fuels. And they certainly intermix with either my office building being a structure or other human development. And yet we're miles from, I'm miles from any wildland. The definition of WUI, uh, if we adopt this definition of vegetative fuels would seem to include this building in the WUI. Is that the intent of the, uh, of the department? Uh, based on where the definition, where your, that goes into where the structures intermix with the, um, where the vegetative layers are. And Chris can help, ex, ex, as he's explained before, and more articulate than I am. The, uh, with the uh, data set for uh, the vegetation, that's part, that's satellite driven in many instances to show the dense, the, the land cover of that, depth, of that. So as you mentioned uh, previously with the being approximately 100 foot by 100 foot squares of looking where the vegetation is, 
some of those structures, some of that may be balanced out by your, by your structure. So it may not necessarily drive just because you have a tree next to your house or your front lawn of pulling you into the wooey. The intent of the, uh, that is to, um, as we get into the, the criteria questions, which I believe are in, a, um, in no two meetings from now, of quantifying uh, the housing density and its relationship to the land, to vegetative cover. That's where those boundary lines get drawn um, to help uh, square out the uh, the areas that make, um, so it's not just a front yard in the middle of a, of a urban area that would put you in the wildland urban interface. It's your proximity to a, a particular land cover. Hi. Uh, yeah. Chris, do you want to add anything to that? And then Dave can have some follow-up here in a second. Uh, you know, I, I think Tim covered it well. I mean, clearly that's vegetation, so we, we can't deny that fact. But as you get into the, the urban environment, you're dominated by this sort of what, what's considered in the wildland world is non-burnable landscapes, which is full of those you know, road systems and people's sidewalks and, and the houses themselves. And so uh, most urban cores end up being that non-burnable and it really, it, which is a some, somewhat of a misnomer because we can see that, that home to home transmission of fire itself, but that that's typically separate of the way wildland fire modeling looks at the landscape that's considered unburnable and it sort of transitions into the state fire marshal's hands. Of course, we've seen that that's not always the case because, you know, homes could be fuel in that case, but we're not considering that at this time. And so where you're sitting, I don't know specifically, but I suspect you're in a in, in what would be classified as non-burnable fuel layers, and you would then be in that no-risk zone. A follow-up? Yeah, well, I'm just uh, I'm just trying to understand if it, it, it sounds like there are additional criteria that uh, that Chris and Tim will use uh, when doing the mapping. If we're applying additional criteria, then why don't we add that to the definition? Let's figure out what those criteria are, so that since there's a significant regulatory component to this uh, to inclusion in the WUI, the more uh, the, the clearer we are, uh, the easier it is for those of us that are going to, that have members that are going to be impacted by the, at least potentially impacted by the regulations to, uh, uh, to understand exactly what that impact's going to be. Jim? I would, uh, um, with some of these, they're walking through the, de the definitions, this, uh, you know, because, uh, Vegetative fuel is just on, uh, you know, vegetative is plants, fuel is something that burns. That's what the, uh, this definition is supposed to be. Um, with these two in particular, it's the principle of dividing the fuel bed um, between what's wildland fuel and what's vegetative. Um, that feeds into the mathematics that drive the drawing of the lines. So this is, these are the fundamental steps to move us forward initially. As we, uh, as Chris mentioned with the, when we're looking at a, a, a pixel and it's predominantly non-burnable that negates what trees and vegetation and front lawns are in that pixel because it's non-burnable. So that's where the, the criteria, the calculations come through as we move through the, uh, the process. So in a nutshell, what I think I hear you saying is, is that the definition, whether or not a particular parcel is, is going to be regulated, um, or not is not just a function of the vegetation, vegetative fuel definition, and includes these other factors that we're going to actually get to later today as well. Is that fair, or am I missing the boat? Well, that's fair, and it's um, looking at December 9th is when we have the uh, the meets and intermingles, which is the key words in determining where those lines are and establishing where those regulated areas are. All right, thank you. We're, here's the cue, so you know. Uh, we've got John, Karna, and Pam. So, Mr. Jennings, take it away. Hey, thanks, thanks, Sharon. Well, thanks everybody for the good work and, and hard work on this, and certainly appreciate Dave's Dave's comments. There are uh, some that we had too. Uh, you know, we went back and and we originally 
in looking at the, the department's recommendation, we're kind of like, you know, what is that term enough? Um, but how, how does that calculate or measure? And so, you know, we kind of went back to the, the international WUI code and looked at sort of the definitions and other items there and, 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 and found for, for, for us the first, <laughs> the, the first time, you know, there was, there was some information about what, what fuels are, I think, and that's in that appendix D, which lists fuel types or types of fuels, that's the lichens, moss, you know, all the way up to trees and so on and so forth. And it just seemed to us that maybe, you know, let's just call, call it what it is. Let's call a fuel a fuel um, rather than try to get into at this juncture, you know, is, is, is Wyoming big stage rest or stage rest of fuel at this height or is it at this height? You know, it, it burns, it's all fuel, right? Um, but also in, in assisting our kind of our, our development of our feelings um, you know, reading that WUI definition and understanding that we do are talking about both vegetative fuels and, uh, and wildland fuels, um, and, then, and then adding that or reading together the definition of, of wildfire uh, in the WUI, um, I, we kinda, I, I became a little concerned to express it last time is that, you know, if we have a separate, if, if vegetative fuels are separate and distinct from wildland fuels, then we would <laughs> We would have fire in wildland, which would not meet the definition of wildfire, which seems just, it, it just, it just, I don't, I have a hard time getting my head around that. <clears throat> so I think, you know, reading these things together, uh, really, let's just say, uh, for starting at the beginning, these are fuels. These are the fuels to get measured. Um, they're vegetative fuels. Uh, wildland fuels are vegetative fuels located in wildland areas. Pretty short and sweet. Uh, but we create that nexus and connective tissues. Uh, for continuity there. Uh, and again, it seems to be consistent with um, the way fuels are, are used, or at least at, at our estimation, uh, in that appendix for fire, mo fire modeling. And, and of course, we do have, you know, definition of fuel, uh, light, heavy, medium, so on and so forth, which I think are probably useful as, as we progress down the way. So um, as I think was mentioned in, in, in the chat there earlier about you know, we can go, we will get to these terms like, you know, like intermingled and so on and so forth. And I think we will, um, but we just were just left wondering if just maybe just simply calling it what it is um, <clears throat> that uh, looking at this match here, we see it fuels of burns, fall down fuels or vegetative fuels, small and area. I think, I think that's what we're saying, right? Anyway, just kind of starting at the beginning, but making sure there's, there's a consistency and we don't inadvertently leave ourselves at, at odds with, definitions that we think we probably probably should be abiding by. So I'll just stop there and and, um, and thank everybody for their for their patience. Thank you, John. Uh, Karna and then Pam. Uh, thank, thank you for everybody's time today. Um, you haven't heard from me yet. I am having I am struggling with if this is supposed to be the wildland urban interface Shouldn't there be a nod to the fact that the vegetative fuels need to be within that kind of space instead of a house in the middle of a subdivision that has irrigated lawn and limbed up trees and, and, and that sort of thing? I just, you know, if you read it on its own, it just doesn't, it, you know, it basically covers the entire state of Oregon. It doesn't kind of limit it to what we're trying to define as the wildland urban interface. Response, Tim. You'd, um, you're you're correct in that it, vegetation grows across the state, so vegetative fuels are pretty are grow across the state, um, and uh, plants burn. So that's uh, you know that's a part of the discussion. The when we put it all together, that's what is going to draw the lines on the map um, in the end. So it's just uh, you know defining what the what the fuels is. Um, as we walk through. So from, I mean, from my side of it, from the um, fire protection side, fuels feel, um, regardless, it's uh, the, uh, the terms in the definition is so walk, walking through wildland fuels are in undeveloped areas and vegetative fuels are, are plants um, in, its, in its most common sense. So um, just trying to dissect or uh, split the fuel bed um, is uh, the main pr principle of the exercise. In its relation to and it's re, the relation of the fuels to uh, structures is uh, is coming with the meets and intermittals discussion. 
Thank you. The queue is Pam, Lauren, and Kyle. Pam. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just want to say I really appreciate um, Chris is very down to earth. If it's if it's fuel, it's fuel, and that's how it's going to get mapped. <laughs> um, I think it's really important wherever we go in this whole thing that we make sure that we're mapping what's real and in terms of understanding wildfire risk. But I do have one other suggestion that I brought up earlier and um, we decided not to go that direction for what I thought was very good reason. But now that we're having this discussion, it's, it's coming back to my mind as something we might consider doing. And that is when I read carefully um, Senate Bill 762, it appeared to me that there were two different places in the bill that talked about identifying um, risk classes. And one was under the risk mapping and it said that those risk classes were gonna be entirely based on fuels. But then down in section 33, where it talked about defining the WUI, it very clearly included structural characteristics. And the, yeah, I think it was Tim at the time, I can't recall for sure, but I'm pretty sure it was, explained that ultimately where we need to get to is five basic, five basic risk classes. But I wonder if it wouldn't be helpful for us and for um, regulatory considerations to think about different kinds of WUI types. And another thing that besides this conversation that's going on here that is causing me to think about this is that article that um, Chris sent out yesterday and that I somehow managed to read after dinner <laughs> about situations where situations where the real fire risk is actually structure to structure transmission, even though the context is more, you know, there's a lot of vegetative fuels around. I think I am currently staring out the window at a set of trees that are very much like what Dave Honeycutt just described. Um, you know, I live in one of those bend neighborhoods with big old mature ponderosa pine trees. And, and I wonder if it would be helpful to think, to have a map layer in the uh, Oregon Explorer that is not specifically about risk, but is specifically about kinds of wooey. And so one of them is places where structure to structure fire is actually the bigger risk. Another one is a place where it's really wildland fire that is really the bigger risk. Perhaps another one is about crops, something like that. Um, and that would perhaps give us an opportunity to distinguish how these different places are gonna get treated and considered. And it doesn't change whether or not it's high, low risk, you know, that's really determined based on fuels, but it might provide some different kinds of opportunities to think about how, what's appropriate in terms of defensible space and so on and so forth. And that might be different from, you know, an area like, I think it sounds like Dave and I are sitting in to um, places where there's only one house per 40 acres. Tim? Uh, uh, definitely can look into that. There's, uh, there, uh, Erica knows this better than I do. There's, there's a, there are a few established methodologies for identifying different types of wild and urban interface. Um, so that is, uh, that's part of, that ties into that meets and intermingles discussion where we'll, where we'll be discussing that. And I, I appreciate the context. I don't know if, um, how many folks have been to the um, ODF headquarters in Salem, but um, we have a park on Mill Creek runs through it and we have a park and a forest on campus here. And so um, you know, I understand that uh, that's part, uh, you know, we, we look at the trees in our urban environment and, and where that fits into it. Um, but even looking through that context of uh, where that would fit in and I'd, I'd, it, through this process, I wouldn't see that this would bring something in town into a classified as buoy as well. So definitely, um, you know, looking out the windows, I see the same things that you all do. With the, with the process of trying to set it in the in the proper place. Thank you. Any follow up, Pam? No, I just um, I look forward to thinking about thinking this through with Tim um, and seeing what he comes up with. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's Lauren, then Kyle, Lauren Smith. Hi. So um, I guess I know that uh, we have sort of a differing of a opinion on what um, exclusions of land meant in the bill. And so with that said that, you know, we don't think that just because crops grow on crop, er, managed crops grow on crop land, that that necessarily means you're excluding a whole area of land by just including crops is not part of your vegetative fuels. With that said, if, if plants are fuels, and then so that would include pretty much anything that grows in the ground across the state. Um, I guess my question is maybe for Travis is, is if Will there be the opportunity at the, the, the what the um, what you have to remove for defensible space, where they will be, where you guys will be looking at different types of vegetative fuels and the risk of those vegetative fuels, i.e., so something like uh, irrigated crop is going to be less risky than a bunch of dry unmanaged grass. Um, will, will that be something that you guys look at at that point? Because we keep being told we're going to we're going to narrow this world down. We're going to narrow this world down. And it seems like we keep expanding this world out, 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 out. So where's the point where we kind of figure out? So, yeah, anything that grows in the ground is a fuel. Obviously, it all can light on fire. But something that is irrigated is less likely to light on fire than something that's not. Or something that's managed is less likely to light on fire than just grass growing on a piece of property that no one's growing anything on. Kim? Looking at, I think uh, um, Lauren addressed that one to Travis more so. Okay. Travis, you wanna participate in this comment? Sure, I'd be glad to. Thanks, Lauren. And I know, uh, you know, there's a meeting set up to kind of talk through this. I think, you know, as we've thought about it and as you read um, 762, you know, really the, the definition and the work that this body's doing, right, defines a wildland urban interface and puts it into five classes. And as you look at that and you overlay those two classes, I think at the part of this discussion is really what's in, you know, extreme and high, which is where um, the Oregon State Fire Marshal's Office comes into play with defensible space. And so as this is mapped out, you know, looking at those high and extreme areas, uh, also 762 uh, through the work of the stakeholders, many who are on this group, you know, really narrowly defined um, what is uh, defensible space through chapter 603 and 604 um, of the International Code. And so it also included uh, Oregon best management practices. And so as we think about that, once this you know, body of work is done in those areas are classified, you know, really looking at chapter 603, 604 and Oregon best management practices, you know, in terms of applying um, the kind of methodology laid out in the International Wui Code of Defensible Space. Any follow up, Lauren? Hearing none, Kyle, your turn. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, and Travis is kind of getting at, I, this is more of an observation and a point, something I, I want to make sure we keep in mind. The My principle through this entire process has been that whatever the outcome ends up being, it's got to be something that Oregonians will support, right? If And, and, and I guess the way I'm looking at that statement is that if it becomes so big and, and so broad and uh, that um, people will be like, yeah, we're not, I'm not doing that. It, it's kind of like we used to have an example of leaving the fire danger board up all year long. If people see it 365 days a year, they stop looking at it when it's important. Does that make sense? And so I guess, and I'm hearing, and I like Carrie the way you phrased it, right? Vegetative fuels sort of think plants that will burn. And that's the wildland definition is just where those vegetative fuels are. That makes sense to me. But what we're creating by doing this like kind of building block step by step is that um, if we aren't careful, and it's a little bit like adopting the WUI definition with that or in it, right? I don't think any of us anticipated what that stupid or was going to do to us and the conversation we're having right now about wildland and vegetative fuels. What? Those are the same thing. We have to remain flexible so that when we get done putting all these building blocks together, we can, we can, we can take a step back and look and go, okay, is that the right scale scope and, and, and package that we had intended? And is it going to be implementable, right? We cannot create a situation where Travis and Les have 63 million acres they have to go step on porches with at the end of this thing. 
right? It, it just won't work. So I, I well, I, I, we have to get somewhere productive. I want to make sure we, we remain flexible uh, so that when we get to the point where we're having a conversation about intermixes and intermingles, guys, we are creating a situation where a ton is going to hinge on those definitions, a whole bunch, rather than sort of eating this uh, a little bit at a time. So it's just an observation, Sam. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, there's a lot of things we could achieve with this. I just don't want to achieve, try and achieve too many all at once. Does that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense. And again, from a facilitator's perspective, I want to reinforce, we're calling these pulse poles or poles for a reason to try to use a term that conveys, you've got to look at this iterative process at the end. We're taking interim steps tentative senses of what things go. And then when we have enough of the building blocks to use your uh, phrase together, then there's gonna be this package discussion and that's where the action is at um, here. And so I think that's as clearly as I can say it. Um, and I understand uh, for those people who feel that each of these interim steps is dangerous, I get it. I, I get it. And I'll, I can only say we'll just have to prove up at the end that until we get through these iter little steps, building blocks, come back for the package, that's going to be the state of anxiety or angst that goes on. And if there's a better process way to do all that, other than just saying, trust me, I'm a lawyer, we can go ahead and, you know, consider that. Erica, you're up. All right, I just I just wanted to chime in a little bit. Um, so within a community, um, actually, the, the fuel is the house. Um, the homes are the fuel. So if, if a home is going to burn, it's going to release an order of magnitude more energy than any vegetation that's around it. The whole purpose of this is to prevent the ignitability of our community, so of our, of our homes um, or our schools or hospitals or critical infrastructure. So I, I wanted to just chime in with that point to to just keep that in mind when we're talking about the, um, you know, vegetative fuels and wildland fuels, um, that, that we're reducing all of that around the house to prevent homes from igniting, um, because any home that ignites within the WUI is going to release a lot more energy than any, any vegetative fuel could possibly release. Um, so that's, that's, I just wanted to chime in with that point. Thank you, Erica. Um, last call for this moment um, on either the, um, uh, the vegetative fuels or wildland fuels discussion be before we do um, our pulse poll on these issues one at a time. Last call. All right, uh, Derek. From ODF, um, when you have an opportunity, can you put up the first uh, poll of the day, which is on vegetative fuels? And this includes um, ODF's addition of the word not, um, are not um, uh, to be considered part of the vegetative fuels, are not. So pull away please. Can somebody put the exact definition that's being voted on in the chat so that I can uh, reread it real quickly? As Fair we're... enough. Yeah. Tim, do you have that handy? Yep, pulling it up now.
See what we can do in the next 30 seconds, folks. Again, a reminder, um, if you voted a two or three or any, if, if you voted one, two or three, feel free to uh, put your reasoning in the chat. All right, 10 second warning. All right, um, we'll end the poll. Feel free if you didn't have that opportunity in the poll feature itself to drop it into uh, the chat and it, it will be added up. So uh, the results here are eight folks give it a one, nine folks give it a two, and five folks give it a three uh, for the reasons that you've already put forward in your input opportunity and in the chat. Um, thank you for that. And we'll uh, stop sharing that and ask uh, for the, um, the next poll uh, to come up. And that is on wildland fuels. And that's issue number uh, four here. We have about six more members that are still thinking, which is perfectly fine. I think we have two more members. I'll give you the 20 second warning. I lost the poll, Sam, but I answered in the comment. Oh, no problem. Thanks, Dave. All right. So um, uh, with, with Dave's comment in the chat and orally, we have nine uh, voting a one, 12 a two, and one person uh, voting a three. Uh, because we have a few seconds here, the, I, I suspect this is uh, you, Dave, the uh, uh, curious as to when, quote, development is essentially non-existent and what, quote, development means. So um, ODF uh, responses to the, your thought process behind um, uh, Dave's chat comments. So the um, geographic area structures and other human developments is up on for next meeting. Um, so that's uh, for development in this, it's being proposed as where the fundamental facilities, communication, energy, transportation uh, is other human development is what's proposed. And then the uh, structures are proposed as permanent sited buildings on a tax lot that's used as a home residence or sleeping place by one or more people. Dave, to what extent, if any, does that influence your thoughts on that definition for uh, wildland? Um, 
Uh, I, I don't know, Sam. I, I'll I'll talk to Tim offline on it. Okay. Thank I don't want to waste time. No problems. Thank you. All right, uh, uh, Amanda. Yeah, I just have a quick question. It's a bit of a go back for vegetative fuels, but it's very similar to what Dave had previously asked uh, or just asked. So for vegetative fuels, uh, one of the questions that I have is about defining fire hazard um, because there's a lot in that definition that wavers on how we're defining fire hazard. So um, anyways, I just want to put that out there. I don't know if we're going to go down that path since fire hazard isn't actually in the definition for WUI, uh, but we're going to talk about it somewhat for the risk classes. So, uh, you know, again, I, I just want to put that out there with, um, I, I voted a two for, for that uh, specific definition because of that uh, discrepancy there or, or lack of clarity. Thank you. Tim, any response? Um, it's actually, it's in the, uh, the glossary that uh, Chris and Erica pulled together. They have hazard listed as a danger or potential source of harm. All right. Thank you. All right, let's uh, move on. And um, we are uh, 20 minutes ahead of schedule, so that's great. But I want to keep moving to get you out at a reasonable time. So we'll introduce um, the uh, 1020 item, which is question number six, at what level should fuel loading be measured? Um, and you uh, input opportunities, came back with five of you voting one, two of you voting two, and three of you voting three. And so I will uh, turn it over to um, ODF and OSU for the recommendation um, and the basis for the recommendation and comments on home on the uh, input opportunity and what this recommendation does not mean. So take it away. So we'll start this one off, Chris, and fill in the gaps. Um, the recommendation for this is what, what level should fuel loading be measured is recommending that the fuel loading be measured when fire season occurs. And I can see there's a few uh, notes in there of some, uh, some terms that, we, that are tossed around generally. Um, fires, what we're, the intent of this recommendation is to, you know, when, when is there the, the risk of our two communities of rapid spreading growth of wildfire? So that's what we're looking at when we measure this. This ties into uh, fire intensity is that sort of the ratings in the in, uh, for fire risk. Um, what we're looking at getting out of this is ODF responds to wildfires every month of the year. So we're not looking at when we respond to wildfires. What we're looking at is when the fuels are conducive to rapid spreading growth of, of fire. That, even though what, we tradition, what we've been seeing is, uh, you know, we're, we have large fires more months of the year, the core of that is, has still remained that July, August, September or threshold. That's when our fuels are cured. That's when, the, uh, our, uh, that's when our emergency release components are the highest, or that's when our fuel moistures are the lowest across the board for many of these uh, for many of these areas. So that's what we're looking at um, you know, when, our, when we're setting a risk and taking a risk into where it's uh, a risk on the landscape and for communities, um, that's where we're, we're recommending and utilizing those factors um, as the capturing the intent of what that risk is supposed to capture. So with that, Chris, we wanna jump into some more of the details of how that's, uh, how that uh, uh, fuel loading is, uh, is captured in the modeling. Tim, I, I think you're you're spot on. I don't know that there's a, a a lot more to to add to this. You know, we're we're just trying to reflect that fire hazard when that fire hazard happens, and that happens to be during summer season, and um, that's really what we want to capture to be most relevant to the state of Oregon. So, so do you guys have a a, a date? on calendars to define the term, quote, fire season. So you, that's a defined term in your recommendation. And usually defined terms have, um, you know, more text that clearly delineates. Is there a magic 
set of dates that you use or how does that work? There's a statutory um, establishment of a regulatory framework for fire season. So in, in some instances, there's a reason, there are, there's other terms that tie into these um, and that it, uh, adjusts throughout the state with the intent of the recommendation here with the fire season is to focus on those, uh, those months of when it's traditionally occurred. Normally the regulatory aspect has been a, approximately July through September in many instances, that's expanded out a bit in that different framework. However, the, the layperson's connotation of you know, fire seasons are when fires, large fires occur on the landscape, when Oregonians have been uh, experiencing them, uh, them impacting communities. Um, we do, um, fire risk still occurs uh, across the calendar. We do have responding fire, <clears throat> east fires in the coast range um, in January and February. That's not uncommon. However, um, as we look at when the risk is most, is most uh, with this being trying to focus around uh, protection of our of houses from igniting, that's uh, when the risk of spread is the highest is during those uh, July through September months. But it is distinct, uh, there's fire season is the general term that uh, we utilize, but it's not in the regulatory framework is that has a separate meeting and trying to not tie um, too many definitions, uh, unintended definitions together. Okay. The correct so, phrasing in that term. Okay. So um, the uh, cue for clarifying questions is uh, John, Carrie, and Jim. Thanks again, you guys. And appreciate appreciate all your work on this. Um, so we're on, this is question, we're on question six, correct? So this is a Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Real good. So I mean, so I think uh, it what you guys are proposing, what the partners are proposing, made sense. And we, it also seemed to us, and I think maybe may touched on a little bit is uh, if there would be value to just establishing a date, um, and that way, you know, there's some continuity there. There's a baseline you can make. It would seem like it could be more measurable year to year um, for for any number of ways. Maybe that's not right. And so I guess I was, I was just curious. Um, I guess I'd been under the impression that, you know, fire season was when it was declared, but I, I, I'm not sure if the Board of Forestry, maybe it's the State Forestry, they kind of said fire season started now, um, or whether uh, or whether that's wrong. But again, just, I mean, our, our presumption, our thought was that if we had it, if they had was fixed, and you can look, you know, looking looking backwards in time, you know, when we're out there ways, you know, you could be able to, to, to see how things uh, line up. Uh, apples to apples, but if, if that's wrong, then you know we're certainly open to uh, to hearing an explanation. I mean, if, if the experts say, "Well, yeah, thanks on paper that makes sense," but in reality, using this way really is better. Um, you know, we'll defer to that. But I just I just be curious about about thoughts or feedback on uh, on that aspect. Thanks, John. And let's take comments from Carrie and Jim, and then I'll turn it over to ODF OSU. So, Carrie, you're up. Yeah, I'd just like to know what the point of this question is. <laughs> I don't see how um, this question is relevant to the discussion of how you map the worry. Um, to my understanding, when um, wildfire risk and hazard are being modeled, there that happens in the context of a fire behavior model that has a probabilistic distribution throughout the year when fires happen, and there's fuel curing associated with that, and it basically accounts for that curing throughout the year in that calculation of risk. And so um, I'm not sure why we would say how, why we'd try to tie fuels to the fire season when fire season moves around, it's defined by the fire marshal. It will have specific meanings, perhaps in other contexts, but I don't see how it relates to the conversation we're having here about how to define the WUI or how to model risk. And I think, Chris Dunn is probably the best set to answer that question. Sorry, Chris, get under the bus. Yeah, <laughs> get under the bus. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris, you're up. Oh. You're under the bus now and it's backing up. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is those fuel beds that do turn over at some point um, mid-summer, if you will or late summer for that matter. And these are typically harvested fuels, right? And so 
croplands and that sort of thing. So, so how do you how do you weigh in and decide whether you or might... annual grasslands, Chris? I mean, your grass field beds also cure your herbaceous field beds, and don't oh. they cure in the models? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, they do cure in the models, but at some point they're not necessarily removed like you might remove winter wheat, right? And so there is a rapid transition in fuel loading that occurs in many lands across Oregon that is relevant to this conversation and how we model fire behavior, not so much in how we define wildland urban interface. And that's what this question really is tiered for. Okay, we'll, we'll circle back. And my follow-up is like, how are you thinking about doing that modeling, I guess? I mean, are you really gonna, are we gonna make that decision here and now? That seems odd to me. Chris? Uh, well, this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the problem is the modeling takes almost a year to do. If we don't make decisions now, we don't get it in the model. Right. So the, the decisions have to be made before somewhat in advance of how we go about addressing this. And that's what we're here doing and why we're, at, we're talking about this question up front so much. We could either include, let's just say, Willamette Valley grass before it's harvested or after it's harvested. Typically, we do it after harvest. That's when fire season sets in. It's typically green before it reaches that point. This is the, the case in point that we're trying to address here. Winter wheat is similar, uh, only it gets dried down to the point where it does combust quite, quite readily at times and puts uh, a lot of values at risk because of that. Okay, let's take Jim and we'll circle back and have a holistic conversation. And we have some suggestions in the chat as to uh, potential different definitions. Uh, Jim, you're up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is kind of a little bit of a, just a general comment, uh, but also maybe uh, agreeing with Carrie's comments earlier, don't really understand why we're even part of this conversation for making this decision. I think I will include myself in this. There's not a hell of a lot of us around the table that have got any kind of expertise or experience dealing with a number of some of these technical details. And I think ultimately this comes down to an ODF an OSU call, period. I really think that's where the decision point needs to be because you're asking us to essentially collectively try to evaluate whether it's Willamette grass or some other type of crop or what have you, when realistically that decision needs to be coming from really the state agency who's gonna be in charge of this. Okay, thank you. So, um, Pam, did you want to put forth uh, your suggestion here? Um, sure. I just had a very simple suggestion um, that I put in the chat earlier. And, you know, to try and avoid having to define fire season, I, my suggestion was that um, fuel should be measured when fire is, um, I can't remember even my specific language, but most likely to occur. Um, and I think that I th that makes sense to me because, you know, if there's, say, rangeland or something like that, um, where there is a lot of fuel, you know, in May, but it gets eaten up by all the cows by the time <laughs> the fire season gets bad, um, it's not actually that much of a risk. Um, you know, so I think that, I think that makes that might be a way to help. Curious what others think. Thank you. Uh, Holly. I was just wondering if um, maybe ODF or, or maybe Chris Dunn could speak to the trade-offs between choosing um, a percentage versus a value. I think I understand the discussion, but I want to better understand ODF's recommendation that we go with a percentage. So what, what are the trade-offs there if we choose one versus another? So if I'm understanding, um, that's going to be question five. Should the risk class thresholds be set as a value or, or as a percentage? And, and we're going to get to that at the noon hour. But if I'm, I'm misfiring here, Tim and... Uh, or Chris can let me know. Is that 
are, or is that relevant to this question as well? Number six. Uh, no, that will be addressed, uh, I guess, around noon. Okay, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was probably merging the two. No problem. It's easy to do, believe me. Um, any any other, um, so Pam put a proposal in the chat. It's what if we change, quote, fire season, unquote, to, quote, the season during which wildfire is most likely to occur, unquote. What do um, OSU and ODF think about that? I think it fits um, and it helps alleviate the uh, statutory designation of fire season, um, which I put in quotes in the initial one. Um, but uh, so the department recommends that fuel only be measured um, during the season, which wildfire is most likely to occur. Um, so if you could drop that into the chat to see, Chris, um, what are your on the ground um, thoughts, especially consistent with what Jim mentioned a few minutes ago about you're the one doing it. Does, it, does, does this work for you? And we're deferring to your expertise. Yes, what I heard yes. This, this is ultimately all this question is intended to be. There's no hidden agenda, no nothing behind it. We just want everybody's agreement that we're going to, to, to address this at the time that it's most relevant to fire. And okay. pretty much just move on. It's not intended to be anything big and, and magnanimous. We just want everybody to understand that things do change on landscapes, but we want to measure that fuels at a particular time when it matters most to fire and have everybody understand that that's the best path forward or at least accept it, that is. And I had a, um, just in response to Jim's comment as well, and um, Chris summarized this for, uh, for us a bit in our planning meeting is there's there's gonna be a, there are a lot of technical questions that are that are added in here there are a lot of questions that really get into the parameters and it's in a it's in a purpose of transparency across this this uh, Oregon's undertaking um, going through rulemaking in a process that there for the first time um, in the country normally um, what happens is that folks sit in a room um, a bunch of modelers similar to Chris and they make decisions and that's the model and that's where they go with it. This is with us being doing going through the rulemaking process of codifying how the model is performed and making sure we do it in a transparent manner is the purpose of what these technical questions are, making sure they're explained and understood by uh, what goes in, how the risk is developed, what values are part of that risk and the timing associated with it, the route, when the maps get updated, all of this, all of these uh, seemingly very technical questions are to walk through, make sure um, as a group, we have a full understanding of what all goes into this. Because as Kyle mentioned, that this, the whole point of this is to make sure that it's implementable. Um, we previously had a, 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 our Senate, or uh, the Forest Land Urban Interface Wildfire Def or uh, Defensible Space Act, that was not, um, there wasn't implementable over time. So utilizing that, having a broad group that understands what goes into the map, how the lines are drawn, where the risk is determined from, and help um, and building out that group is what is going to make this successful. And to have that understanding of why someone's classified as a certain risk and why the methodology was developed to, uh, to establish them in the wildland urban interface. So seemingly if, if uh, and walking through these questions helps us to uh, make sure that there's an understanding around these uh, technical terms instead of it just being developed in a black box and dropped on to a map on the Oregon Explorer. So that's the purpose of walking through these um, and, making, and asking the questions and making sure the information is clearly understood. Thank you for that, Tim. Roger. Uh, thanks, Sam. So I guess I'm a, I got a question and then a comment after that potentially. So. The question I have is the practicality. What's the difference between what this, what you're now saying, in what season which wildfire is most likely to occur, and saying fire season? Uh, I want to know what, what, how that is different. Those two phrases be implemented differently. So fire season has a statutory 
term in 477-505. Um, it's, it's semantics rephrasing it, but that it's taking, removing that statutory regulatory term from the conversation and just capturing when that time period, as I mentioned earlier, our core portion of when fires have the propensity of uh, rapid growth um, due to the fuel uh, to the fuel beds, rapid growth and, uh, and threaten the communities. So the intent is is just rephrasing it a little bit, but has the same intent. Okay, so with that, I I, I think if we're you're better off using the the term fire season than when fire is likely to occur, because some people can interpret it when fire is likely to occur if we get a a cold dry spell in February or March, like we did a couple of years ago, and you get a fire burning through uh, an oak savanna due to dry east winds in February, uh, that could, people could assume that, that becomes when light fires likely to occur, even though that was clearly outside of defined wildfire or defined fire season. And I think for purposes of regulation and implementation, you need to have a defined timeline, not just when fire is likely to occur, because as you said, fire can occur and does occur 12 months of the year in Oregon and some parts of Oregon. So if you don't have it's a defining timeline, it's just you've left it open to anyone's interpretation. And I don't think that's appropriate for when you're talking about regulations. And then Tim, I guess I'm gonna take a little bit of exception to you said the past, what we had for WUI was unimplementable. And I disagree with that entirely. Uh, it was implementable. It, it was implemented in many counties, but it wasn't in other counties. The main reason it wasn't implemented, it wasn't funded. So this process will have the exact same problem that the, the past 25 years have had, that if it's not funded, it won't be implementable. Uh, that was clearly implementable. People had defined rules. They knew what they were. The statutes were clear where it affected. But if you don't fund it, it won't be implemented. And this is the same process. So I, I just disagree with your statement that what we've had in the past wasn't implementable. And I and just for the for you know interest of full disclosure, I had a lot to do with writing the one 25 years ago. So it's a little uh, hit, hit a raw nerve there, I guess, when you say it wasn't implementable. Okay, thanks. Uh, before I get to Mary, Kyle, Chris, um, and Tim. So uh, my sense of the discussion now in the moment is that if we use the quote, the quote fire season unquote term, that may give reference to a statutory scheme um, and implications from that term. And on the other hand, what I hear Chris saying is he's looking simply for a input opportunity and parameter to put in the model to hit run and then apparently come back in a year and then it spits out an answer. So Chris, let's start with the practical version of this and, response, and respond to Roger with that in mind. Uh, from a modeling perspective, why is this important to you? Um, I, I, why is the difference between the definitions? I, I don't think that either of those definitions would change choosing one of those definitions over fire season versus when fire is most likely to occur would change what I would do. I don't, I don't see any reason why that would. Yes, fires can occur throughout the year. There is a most likely season you know, we do have, you know, the random events like Roger was talking about, but that wouldn't be the most likely time. That would be a, a abnormal time. And so even with the most likely, we'd still end up in that bound between basically June 1st and October 1st. Okay. Um, let's turn it over to Tim on the, what I'm framing for shorthand as the legal reference point and your concerns about that. And then the key I would one. go ahead. I would agree with uh, with Chris to an extent. Um, if I phrase this in a rule, I would have to I would have to phrase it as when fire season generally occurs, and put have that disclaimer just due to the fact that each uh, portion of different portions of the state go into fire season at different times. Um, so that uh, that would be uh, one aspect as well. Um, so as we uh, 
is go through that. We're still talking about a very similar time frame, however, with that regular with the that uh, regulatory framework has changed much over the last uh, few years outside of uh, um, outside of a few weeks on the beginning or tail end. So I think we're still in the same um, aspect, but I would add that it gener uh, the generally to the uh, to the statement. Well, okay, why don't you put that in the chat while I call on Mary Kyle, then Sean, then Amanda. Mary Kyle, thanks for your patience. Well, that discussion was, was helpful. Maybe what Tim's gonna write will in, illuminate this, but I'm still going back to Carrie's question of how is this going to be used? It seems to me we've shifted into a discussion of modeling hazard and you know probability and uh, fuels without actually acknowledging that. And then, so I'll just also echo what Jim McCauley earlier said about that seems to be a technical scientific undertaking that um, most of us uh, are not equipped for, nor should we. And fire season is shifting and growing and it depends on what part of the state you're in. And that just seems artificial to try to um, define it at too fine a level of detail or uh, granularity at this point. But again, uh, we've shifted from defining particular terms in the international WUI definition to, it seems, trying to figure out how to model fire hazard. And I'm not sure that's a good use of this group or many of us in this group. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, just to speak on the, the, the proposed definition um, and just based on the experiences that we go through in the, within the fire service, it, I think the way, at, as it's written, it's, it's vague, it keeps it open because as we're finding our weather is changing, our fire seasons are changing, they're hard to predict. So it kind of just keeps it open rather than sets it down to a specific time frame. It has to be able to be, be able to move. So um, I agree with the way that it's written just for that circumstance. So it just keeps it open, so. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, again, Chris, sorry, as our subject matter expert here, this one's gonna go to you. Um, with the, you know, either either of the options that we have in front of us um, related to fight, you know, using specifically fire season or when fire is most likely to occur. Um, to me, uh, I know this gets into the sort of the next conversation related to the fire mapping of, you know, value or percentage of risk. Um, would the output from the model then be an average over that entire season? Or would it be at, at any explicit time within that season? Because, you know, beginning of fire season, middle of fire season, after, you know, end of fire season, you're going to have different levels of, you know, weather's different during all of those times. So is there a specific threshold or number or relative humidity or, you know, is there something else that goes into that? I'm just a little bit confused as far as the actual output. All right, so I think we're we're mixing a couple couple things here. We're we're just talking about the fuel bed, right? And so that that'll largely be an, an average over the season, right? So we're we're classifying vegetation from space. We have to search painfully technical here, but the satellite imagery has to be cloud free and so we can see the ground. And so that shifts the exact timing when that Landsat satellite imagery that repeats its uh, image taking every 16 days occurs. And so you find that the best available image in there, you gotta you know, extract the clouds, you gotta extract smoke, any of that stuff. And so you're looking for a consistent um, measurement of the ground cover. Now, when fire behavior is modeled, that becomes um, a distribution across the fire season, if you will, which is when do we see under what energy release components the fire danger, um, when it reaches a threshold at which fires begin to occur as observed by actual observations, we start to see those growing across the landscape. 
that's all then tiered towards weather, which brings in the relative humidity and so forth. And so all we're really talking about here is the vegetation fuel bed, not the broader suite of how the modeling comes together. That makes that answer your question, Amanda? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think what I gathered is that um, in general, the fuel bed will typically be similar throughout fire season. I guess, I guess where I'm thinking about is more those, um, the, uh, you know, the, the grasses and the, the one hour fuels, right? And so how those change over time and how that affects how fuel, how fire burns. And so I guess, you know, maybe we're conflating it, but in a, in a lot of cases, I feel like there are changes to that fuel bed and its flammability over the entire season. So I guess, um, again, I guess I'm, I think I'm, I'm understanding you're talking more about an average, but um, I just wanna make sure that we're clear on, on what, what that really means and what the output of that model actually results in, right? Thank you for that. So um, what I think we're gonna do here because of the time is let's take a, uh, let's come back at 1030 and we will pick up the conversation with um, Dave Honeycutt's 1015 chat, which is, is this determination going into a rule or is this OSU ODF asking for affirmation of the direction they're likely to go? And then we'll put a bow on this and take our pulse poll. So thank you for your robust conversation. We will be back at uh, 1030. Thanks so much.
Hey folks, in case you're just listening in and waiting to turn on your videos, it's 1032 and we'll get back to it as soon as we get a critical mass on screen. Hey, Kyle Williams, Kyle Williams, and John Jennings. What's that? I think you mentioned before, what's the landscape picture behind you? Yeah. So that's coming down into halfway off the off the wall. So you're looking north into the Minum and all that country. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a good country up there. Yeah, it's awesome. It's my favorite place. <laughs> I don't blame you. Okay, folks, 30 second warning. 30 second warning. All right, here we go. It's 11.33 and some change, and we're going to pick up where we left off. I, I want to, as I mentioned, um, get um, uh, ODF feedback on Dave's chat, and in essence, it is this recommendation as to um, what level should uh, should fuel loading uh, be measured? Um, is, is this something that's going to go into a rule, administrative rule, or is this more behind the scenes modeling guidance or both? I think both uh, with it, you know, uh, the, the, we've been, excuse me, tripping over my own words already. No problem. My tongue's still on break. The, uh, at a previous meeting, we would discuss that we'll be utilizing um, fire frequency and fire intensity to determine the risk. And this is a port and that is going to go into rule. This is a component of wildfire intensity that we'd also like to put in the rule so that um, the folks affected by these rules can read them and know that know what is a part of the determine what is the determination of what wildfire risk category and how it was uh, how it was uh, constructed. Um, for their for the risk analysis. So yes, we would like to put this into administrative rule um, for that full package, as well as Chris uh, getting a head start on what OSU has to run for the for the model as well. So this helps him get that start in the uh, in the uh, analysis process as well. Okay. And then um, while I'm taking any other comments, if you could put into the chat whatever uh, uh, evolving recommendation du jour you have as a result of this conversation, because I'm gonna tee up the first pulse poll after we give everyone an opportunity to speak. So um, any other thoughts or comments or suggestions uh, uh, before we take a pulse poll on the language that Tim is put, probably putting in the chat as we speak? All right, so Derek, if you'd be so kind as to put up the chat, uh, put uh, rather the pulse poll up, and then we will look uh, uh, to Tim's definition, which dropped in at 1036. For those of you who don't have access to the screen, uh, it, it, the recommendation is as follows. The, the, the department recommends that fuel loading be measured when, quote, fire season, unquote, generally occurs. The department recommends that fuel loading be measured when, quote, fire season, unquote, generally occurs. Please roll.
Got about five more members weighing in. Three more members. Hey, Sam, this is Tanner. I'm an offer, Sean. I'm just hanging out on the meeting because I'm going to take, take over at the end. I've got a poll in front of me, but just want you to know you don't need to wait on mine because Sean should be polling. Oh, okay. Thanks, Tanner. Hopefully now waiting for one more member unless they haven't had a chance to get back on, which is understandable, and they can catch up by putting their uh, po poll number and their comments in the chat. I'll give you uh, 10 more seconds here. Last call. And we're good to go. Uh, we have 13 people in full support, seven people agreeing with modifications. That, of course, is the two, and no one voting a three. I'll give you a second um, uh, to put comments in the chat. If you voted one, two, or three, all are fine uh, ideas to put in the chat. And then I will uh, direct Tim um, to uh, and Chris to get get prepared for our next question, which is question five, um, and that is. Oh, yeah, here. Seven, Sam. I'm sorry. Question seven. You're correct. Should interim disturbances wild. Uh, inter parentheses large wildfires be considered and that that is question seven and I'm getting to my notes on that and what happened uh, there in your um, input opportunity uh, the, the o ODF recommendation was the department recommends that large disturbances that occur between wildfire risk assessments be captured in the subsequent wildfire risk assessment update Nine of you voted a one, two of you voted a two, and um, three of you voted a three. So, uh, Derek, if you'd be so kind as to uh, close the poll, and um, we can then turn it over to uh, Tim and Chris to tell us a little bit more about the basis for your recommendation, what the recommendation is not meant to be, what your thoughts were in response to the various comments we received. Then I'll open it up for clarifying questions, member discussion, and preliminary polling if we're ready for that. So take it away, Tim. Okay. I'll start this one off and I know Chris has some uh some neat visuals to help tie the converse, the uh, discussion together towards the end here before we get to the recommendations. So um, the initial question posed, this was, I think back when um, Chris had the presentation and had the decision space slides, we spent some time talking about where some of those decision space are to, uh, with the group to look into different aspects of fire, of, of modeling and uh, fire risk as we go through and have um, to have an understanding of what all goes into that. Um, one of those was disturbance we discussed. Uh, um, there's a couple different types of disturbances. We got uh, um, wildfire is the, is the uh, most obvious one, um, as well as mitigation treatments and uh, trying to capture, you know, do we take those into account as they re retain the, uh, when we do uh, manipulation of vegetation or the forest thinning, um, range management, that kind of stuff, um, do we take that into account immediately, do, um, or do we uh, let the next risk assessment uh, bring that together in that, uh, in that form to uh, take into account the uh, intensity and uh, um, the, the history frequency of wildfires. So with that, the uh, department's recommendation in light of that is that um, we recommend that large disturbances um, that occur between wildfire risk assessments be captured in the subsequent wildfire risk assessment. And what's that's intended to mean is that um, indiv individually over time, 
we do um, even the bootleg fire that happened um, this summer. Um, that has a, that the flashy fuels for that will be back um, already next spring in some regards in the brush afterwards. So it was to it was intended to help moderate in, in, uh, some of the effects of um, change of vegetation, um, with as well as providing some consistency across that risk, um, tying into the, the way that uh, fire frequency and intensity helps to uh, equalize across the state um, where that uh, that risk development. This was to uh, in that same um, manner of providing a, a, a way to have uh, consistency and be able to not all of a sudden uh, jump regulatory frameworks um, across the board um, just because they're someone's adjacent to a large fire. Um, in essence of dropping an area that has a long fire history of being in higher extreme risk, all of a sudden drop into low because the uh, assessment was ran when there was no, when uh, there, uh, you know, the area around the bootleg fire is an example that flashy fuels would be back uh, already. But um, if the models ran at the end of October when it's uh, scorched earth, um, then it's going to, um, has a propensity of changing the regu the regulatory portions. So to keep some consistency as well as with the uh, property owners of what they what they are required to do, some of the regulations and uh, to maintain that updates of the uh, the maintenance of the, some of that fire risk and uh, helps provide some stability over time and capture it in the next risk assessment is the recommendation. Chris, anything to add? Yeah, I got some visuals that, that I will help clarify um, what we're talking about. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's okay with you, Sam. Fire away, share away. We'll take the fire pun. Okay. I'm assuming that everyone has can now see this. Yes, indeed. Thank you. We've seen this map before. So this is the fire intensity map that I've shown at previous presentations from the 2017 PNW QRA. Everything and we're going to show you for uh, the basis or background of, of both question seven and five are built off of data from the existing QRA. So these are not exact numbers and we're not thinking about these thresholds or these conversations with respect to what we are currently creating. So we're, we're looking back as a way to understand these questions and think about them. Um, and eventually we'll have the data and, and you know, we can look at it at that time and uh, maybe reevaluate. But so just keep that in mind. We're not looking at it and saying, oh, this is this right now. This is the risk rating. Um, we should draw that threshold at that absolute number because all these things are gonna change a little bit, but the process does not. And so they're gonna look similar. The process is gonna be the same uh, and that's what's key here. And so I, I wanted to show you this larger map, um, not only to give context to the, the question five discussion we'll have later, but to show a few things when we do these quantitative risk assessments. And, and in particular, and relevant to question seven is, is you know, how are the fuel beds with these disturbances are captured? And um, I can draw your attention to say, the easiest point is very extreme Southwest Oregon. And, and you can see amongst an otherwise red landscape, i.e. expecting high flame lengths, a big blue blotch. And many of you from down there would recognize that as the Chetco bar fire, right? So that occurred two years prior to this, the creation of this particular risk assessment. And I wanted to draw your attention to that because what happens is we're capturing to the degree that we can the real time fuel beds that are modified by these disturbances pretty significantly. And you can see that effect here with regards to Chetco bar, all these other fires heading up um, into the Roseburg area and up the Umpqua, you can see all of those. Or you can look over here towards John Day to the Canyon Creek fire effect. So if that's the case, we, we capture that in the QRA, it ends up shifting that risk profile 
temporarily until those fuels grow back. And we capture that in these maps. And that's important for many decision-making um, efforts that go on with respect to the current wildfire risk. But it, it complicates the stability of policy where we may want, we don't necessarily want somebody that's, that somebody being rated at low risk today because of a large fire that surrounded their community, knowing that in five years, that's likely to change. And so then you start to end up with people popping in and out of these risk classes because of these very dynamic disturbances and events that occur. And you can see that here. And you can see that, and this is the flame length, right? And so then we can also see it play out in the burn probability. The same footprints of those recent fires play out um, all across Oregon, the same ones I pointed out. And I'll zoom in um, here on the next slide. This is just that, that same burn probability map that you've seen in the past as well. And so as we zoom into here, the John Day, um, near and dear to many people's hearts, but um, this really destructive Canyon Creek fire footprint is right here, very evident in the modeling exercise. This is the kind of detail we want to see in these type of modeling exercises, but when it comes to the policy, those living within the Canyon Creek fire may be temporarily at a lower risk situation, but clearly they do not maintain that in all instances and will grow out of that. So the question becomes, how do we want to address this with respects to the policy that's been handed to us? Um, do we want to allow folks to say rebuild or not be not, not have the obligation of defensible space or home hardening um, because of a temporary disturbance effect? And then the next iteration of when we do this, they start to fold into that and then maybe bounce out and so forth going through time? Or do we wanna stabilize this? And we stabilize that in, in respects by growing these fuel beds into the future to something that's post disturbance, say 20 years in the future that are reflective of the fuels that are coming so that we are being a little more consistent with the fuel beds that may be that are not temporarily modified. And you can see that how that would play out here with the communities within the canyon, um, just south of John Day. And so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and stop there, um, and 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 just leave this up at least for now for for conversation backdrop. Um, I, I think our recommendation is to grow these landscapes into the future slightly, not to like a 70 year chaos, but into the future to be, to stabilize that in and out of these risk classes once they're developed. So before I open it up to questions for clarification, uh, Chris, uh, tell us the why, and you may already have, but why you're gonna wait to um, look at these and capture them in the subsequent QRA. What, 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 what would be the alternative? If there was to be an alternative to that recommendation, what would it be? And why does this one make sense uh, it, it, to you? We may need to work on the, the, the language around the recommendation a bit to be clear to what we're describing. I think that's fine, but... Um, you know, we're gonna carry disturbances no matter what into future QRAs. That's gonna always occur. What we end up doing and what we're talking about here is two parallel processing efforts. One where we wanna be reflective of this for near-term decision-making in wildland fire management, in fuels mitigation actions that are occurring over say the next five years before we have the next iteration. Um, you would not necessarily want to allocate $5 million to a hazardous fuels reduction program in a just burned landscape like you might in the green forest. However, when we're talking about the longevity of homes and people's properties and, and their relation to these regulatory processes, I think it's, it's far more useful to stabilize that backdrop. 
And so while we'll carry these disturbances forward, the disturbance should not allow somebody to pop out and back in and out and back in and, and end up in this sort of in and out of a class that would otherwise require them to regulate at one point in time and not another, and then back in and not another. That, that's how I see the heart of this question. Okay. Uh, the cue is Pam, then Amanda. So Pam, take it away, please. So this, um, this particular image is really close to my heart because I spend a lot of time um, in John Day and in the Strawberry Mountains um, in which this fire occurred. And I've driven up that road with all the little houses in the canyon that got burned over and um, know several people who lost their homes to that fire. And I really appreciate I really appreciate Chris's recommendation that we need to stabilize. Um, we need to stabilize things like the people who live in this canyon, you know, and I've seen a number of the houses go back up and some of the people who simply did not have the money to rebuild because they didn't have insurance are not going to be rebuilding. Um, you know, we do need to, we do need to think about defensible space in those situations and there needs to be a, a clarity that that's coming. However, I also work in a context in which I'm involved with a number of different agencies that are trying to figure out how to put things like NRCS money and um, Senate Bill 762 mitigation money towards the most significant problems that are out there. And, um, and treatments in the Canyon Creek are just not the most significant problem right now um, because, you know, while there are flashy fuels on the ground, the grasses have grown back. That's nothing like the 200 foot flame lengths that we saw when the trees were burning. And those aren't coming back for a little while. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm racking my brains trying to come up with a way to address this. And I wonder if there is technologically a way to present the information in Oregon Explorers so that you can have current status of things. But then could you have overlays that are predicted risk at five, 10, 15, 20 years out that could also be taken into consideration both for um, regulatory concern, but also for allocation of resources to mitigate the, um, the problem so that we can get the resources to the places that are most at risk first. And, um, and we don't harangue people who are just rebuilding with defensible space, which is gonna be easy for them because they have no trees in there anyway, because they all burned up. Um, <laughs> Um, but let, you know, but some kind of warning that this is coming and this is where they're going to be going in the next, in the next couple of decades. Is that technologically possible? Uh, yes, it basically entails running the same calibrated fire simulation models on the two different fuel beds, one that we grow into the future, if you will, two decades out, for example, and the current one, so that we are reflective of both current and that potential. And we're not talking about climate change and all of that. We're just talking about, hey, this fuel bed's going to come back. You know, climate change is a, is a separate issue in this. We're just saying, you know, like, we don't want somebody to invest in a whole bunch of, say, landscaping and, and tree, tree planting or home design that is then gonna require, you know, adjustments five years down the road, just because at one moment they, in, in time, they were, they were out of this, right? We don't, we, we, that, that's what we want to avoid. It's, it would be unfair, I think. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It would be unfair. And as people are in the process of building back in Canyon Creek, they should build back knowing that even though their risk is low now, it's not gonna stay that way. All right. Uh, Go ahead, Pam. Finish. Yeah. Sorry. All right. The cue is Amanda, then John. Amanda, you're up. 
Yeah, thanks. And I really appreciate um, the words that you just presented there, Pam. I tend to agree. I think from a regulatory perspective, we need to be consistent across the entire map. So I don't think we should do something different for how regulation is going to be addressed for, you know, be imposed on people in fire air, you know, in, in past disturbances compared to other places, because there's other disturbances out there as well that affect fuel. So ice storms, wind storms, things like that. I think that we need to be consistent about how we are, you know, ad addressing these, these fuels, the fire intensity and the burn probability. I do like the idea about, you know, educating. And I think if Travis is still on, I'd be curious to hear if that's something in the education side about, um, you know, future risk or growing that out um, as an education tool if the Community Risk Reduction Fund would be able to be that, uh, would be able to work in that space, but not, but not have that growing out period be incorporated into the actual regulation of those locations. Travis, you happen to be on? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. You know, it's a great question. I know we've connected on this topic before and uh, with 762, it did create a community risk reduction fund. And I think from the Office of State Fire Marshal, you know, we've been um, really clear all along. I mean, our goal and objective is to help support efforts and to incentivize efforts and use education and prevention um, always as the first step. And so I think as you look at Canyon Creek and you look at other places across Oregon, you know, the Community Risk Reduction Fund is a place to go to help incentivize to help use education and prevention, um, you know, due to a potential future risks. Um, I think that's in the, the realm of probabilities and possibilities. Thank you. John. Hey guys, thanks again. I, um, I do, I can't resist commenting on, on these slides a little bit with uh, this, this fire in, in Grant County and with those homes that were destroyed, there was, there was a bunch of them. Um, not like the fires in the KM Canyon or McKenzie River Canyon, but there's a bunch of them. And, um, and, and some of that story is that they never were rebuilt and those families left. I mean, they left the community. And for a situation, you know, a county with 7,000 people to lose a couple handfuls of families, it's a huge hit. It's a really big deal. It can leave them reeling. You know, so that's sort of, I guess, you know, more of a social, a social consequence or community consequence of uh, wildfire that, um, you know, one of, among the universe of things that we're, that we're talking about. I was going to be honest, I also, I really support, I really like the idea of consistency and I like the idea of stabilization. I like the idea of not wanting to uh, unintentionally or artificially um, create a, a blanket of security um, because, you know, it's not... It, it's not necessarily going to be the person that rebuilds that house and understands the risk and knowingly takes it that's susceptible to the event. And those are hazards. It might be the third or fourth person that buys that house that doesn't realize that um, that they're as, as, as prone or exposed to risk as, 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 as the first person was. Um, so now let me ask you a, a, couple, a couple of questions. You know, I've got that on my chest. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, when we talk about disturbance, uh, and this is in our, kind of in our comment. Are we, are we really talking about fire? Are we talking about really any changes on the landscape that could impact fire behavior? This suggests that we're really talking about fire that really, you know, dramatically and, and, and on a large scale, you know, changes that fuel bed. Uh, and if that's okay, if that's what it is, that's fine. Um, although I wonder, I'd hope that the other things get, ac get accommodated as well. And if, we're, and if indeed that's what we're talking about, we're talking about fire, specifically, and we might just save, save fire. And then the, the, the corollary to that was large. I mean, I don't know what a, what a, what a, large, uh, what a large fire or large disturbance would be. Uh, we have a little experience in a very, very different context, totally different um, things, but trying to get our arms around what a, what a large, large thing would be. So I don't know whether this is a, a you know, again, a measured by a, a, a basin or a jurisdiction or an acre or, or what. So I just, um, you know, again, this is, this is a big deal with regards to how, you know, how these things can influence 
the community, but, but more than that, was in, in this particular question, uh, for us to get a better handle on it, I, I would say that, um, that, that ultimately accounting for it at, at the subsequent risk assessment is makes sense to us in a number of different ways. So let's just settle that. Um, but are we really looking at, at wildfire uh, as the disturbance, or are we considering other things too, you know, like solar farms? And, you know, we're, we, we could very well have solar farms covering thousands of acres uh, in, the, in the desert, but we also have large scale solar farms proposed in the, in the forest as well. Things like that. Um, and, and again, what is, what is large? So subsequent, <laughs> subsequent risk makes sense, risk sense makes sense. What's disturbance and what's large, I guess, is the, the bottom line there. Thank you and appreciate your patience. Thank you, John. Any other questions for clarification, policy comments or suggestions for improvement as to the recommendation? So I guess I'll turn it over to ODF to see to what extent, if any, has this conversation prompted you to stick with or rephrase the recommendation we started with. Yep. So this was a, my tackle John's questions. John is a disturbance that's seen as any, any, dis, any manipulation of vegetation, whether it's natural or artificial. Um, wildfire is an easy one because it's something that's common and it's, it, lately it's been on a larger scale so you can see it on a map um, as Chris pointed out, a, little, a lot easier than a solar farm um, or some of the, or even a mitigation project in many instances. So that's why we, we utilize that for the example here. And large um, was just a generic term with this, but since the recommendation was to not um, take it into account, it wasn't uh, elaborated on further. Um, so to clarify with, um, and this ties in with what Chris uh, demonstrated is this, these are captured over the manipulation and growth modeling of the, uh, of the fuel, as he mentioned, um, he commonly uses 20 years as that. So it's not that these disturbances are not taken into account. The intent of the round the question was, uh, say, Cycana states and someone whose house is there all of a sudden doesn't drop into low between uh, renditions of the uh, risk assessment just because of the fire that happened that year um, that that's taken into account later. So then um, I don't have to send a letter to them when they're back into high high risk if they were at that place. So that um, so I'm posing a, a, a little bit of a of a uh, change in the recommendation to take that into account and to clarify that uh, those disturbances. You know, we, we rely on the next risk assessment to capture the manipulation and the fuel modeling, and with that, um, it's the uh, not taken into account. The disturbances are not taken into account between the updates. And that's the time that with the intent of this question was that between the updates would not have a uh, change, the uh, um, but the uh, it would be captured in the growth model um, that is undertaken with the next uh, risk assessment production. So um, I'm going to give Pam an opportunity to comment on her recommendation while you, Tim, put something in the chat that. Uh, best reflects what you just said, and, and we'll figure out what pulse polls we're going to take here in a second. So Pam, thank you for, for laying that out in text or chat form so we can see, but anything you'd like to add to that? Um, perhaps just a, a moment of clarification. Um, I, I am in support of the department's recommendation that events like this be taken into account in the next um, in the next major update. I don't think it's in most cases practicable to, I mean, unless we want to hire a small cadre of people who do nothing but this <laughs> to take into account on a, on a much more regular basis, um, unless there's money around that I'm unaware of. Um, but I do think that in doing this, it would be advisable, at least for focusing money to money for actual mitigation um, to the most needy areas to have information available about current conditions and how those current conditions are going 
our model to change if there wasn't a fire over the course of the next um, 25 years, you know, perhaps at, at five year intervals um, would just be a very useful piece of information to have available in the Oregon Explorer. Thank you. Uh, Megan. Yeah, hi, thanks everyone. This is in response to Pam and I saw your um, comment in the chat. Um, I think that's a great idea. The one thing I do want to mention, as um, I was one of the folks that put together the Oregon Wildfire Risk Explorer originally, there are so many pieces of these risk assessments. So, you know, if you look at that site, there's overall risk layers, multiple ones. There's the um, layers relating to, to hazard or threat. There's the values at risk. There's the uh, previous fire perimeters, all these different things. So one thing we really have to balance is, um, you know, additional pieces of information that may be helpful with the sort of volume of data and information. It really can blow up very quickly. So um, I, I just wanted to sort of throw that out there that I think that's a great idea. And um, I think, you know, Chris would know sort of how feasible that is or how that could be incorporated in. But this communication aspect and the sort of data overload um, can become challenging. So just a quick comment there. Thank you for that. Holly. Just seeking a little bit of clarification on the department's recommendation. So we just had the discussion about kind of a forward looking map that takes into account fuel regrowth and kind of stabilizing the policy, but that is not the department's recommendation. The department's recommendation is just that large, uh, sorry, that well, um, the disturbances are captured in the next risk assessment without doing kind of the forward facing look at fuel regrowth. Do I understand that right? No, the, uh, the fuel regrowth would be, port, would be a part of the next wildfire risk assessment update when Chris runs the next analysis. So that would be part of it. The, um, as, as Chris articulated, it was showing the regrowth. Um, the, uh, what's not taken into account is in between the updates, a large fire would not have, it, would not drop someone's uh, risk designation in between updates to the analysis. And Chris, you could probably phrase that a little better than I could, than I just did there. Chris? Uh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I agree with what, what Tim's saying, but I, I may, maybe, the recommendation needs to, to be reconsidered because this question that just came up about if we're talking about stabilizing the conditions to some degree, we're not talking about going wildly to the, the worst case scenario or, you know, thinking about climate change in a hundred years and what it might look like, you know, but we are talking about at least moderating the effect of some of these disturbances like we see here. This does show up in the risk assessment and it does end up precluding, say, Canyon Creek here from having to be regulated or being provided funds to develop a defendable home. <clears throat> um, I think that's the core of the question that we want to address here is, do we want to sort of smooth out this or, or in inhibit these transient disturbances so that a, a landowner has some stability in, in how their risk is defined? And that is a little bit maybe a different or outside of how the recommendation is written currently, I think. Would you agree, Tim? Um, thinking about that. So yes, we're gonna continue to capture disturbances even at the next iteration, but do we want the disturbance as we see on the screen now to drive the risk rating for these homes or do we wanna stabilize that? And those are two, they are two different questions. And so we may have a subsequent um, recommendation that we need to build over the next couple of weeks to bring back to the group. I don't, I don't know. So just uh, to, we, you know, it seems like at a minimum we have two questions on the table and, and maybe a, a, a third. And so I'm just trying to tease out the questions uh, and you, you will translate it because I'm sure I, I will not get it perfectly. The first is this very narrow 
sequencing question as to when do we run this next thing? And I think there is a general agreement that um, we're going to wait. We're not going to be doing these at a accelerated pace because of a big disturbance. That's point one. Uh, point two is, is that we are going to um, average those out or grow them out as you as you discussed and i'm not sure that's captured in the the literal words in the recommendation that was dropped in the chat and then the third appears to be and i'm sure this is wrong but it, it's kind of a, the non-regulatory piece it's the educational piece uh, that i think pam was talking about and possibly a future funding piece which says yeah here's what it looks like now but if you go to this layer or this other map or this other tool, you will see that in X number of years, um, it's going to change. So beware. And that, that helps with allocation. So are, are, are there really three issues here, Chris? Or am, am I just much, mutzing up the discussion? I think those are those are three conversation pieces circling the same sort of I, idea here. And, and it really... That they're all important for framing and understanding the, the question because when we do the 20, what's going to be the 2022 risk assessment, the, the SICAN estates, it's an easy one to pick on, but even, you, you know, even Blue River for that matter, they're going to show up as low risk. Is that how we want to apply that risk rating or do we want to apply that risk rating on something that's a little more stable where they may show up as not low risk just because those fires happened this time? That, that's sort of the, the central question is I see it. I, we can go either way. We could, in this case, looking at Canyon Creek, say, yes, the, these folks are, are not responsible for home hardening or, or defensible space or not um, a, the, they, they are not in a condition where they could receive funding to support their development of a more, um, I guess, resilient community. Or we could stabilize that and say, actually, they are. And, and it really is an important question in this policy realm. And this is way outside of my wheelhouse because I'm not a policy person. But I look at this and I know how these, these risk assessments work. And we can, you know, every five years, somebody could sort of flop around because of this or we could try to stabilize that is, is really the question. Um, if we don't wanna stabilize that and we do want them to come in and out, we can educate them about that future and look at that as Pam had suggested and offer that information and provide that for sure. Um, and then let the regulations follow as they do. I don't really know what's right or, or any of that. It's just, it is something that's gonna come up and something I think we, we really wanna think about. All right, Pam's from Patience, so thank you, Pam. I think Chris makes some really, really good points. <laughs> and I have, I have another perspective and consideration that I don't think has been entirely raised yet. And that is um, just based on my personal knowledge of several of the folks that live in Canyon Creek. And and perhaps one of the things that came from my recommendation about sort of multiple years out, and that is that if we, if we were to rate that area at the same high risk as the surrounding areas, people wouldn't buy it. Um, you know, several people have said on this, on this conversation so far that one of the things that's very important is putting something together that makes sense and is credible to the people, especially the people that are gonna be regulated by this. And the people who used to live in a forest and now live in a grassland and who see that the risk assessment says that their risk hasn't changed as a result of that are good, you know, and those are the people who we most are hoping for compliance to have is people who live in, in places like that, um, they're gonna be like, <laughs> these people have no idea what they're talking about. And I think it's gonna reduce the credibility if we say that they still have, exist under the same amount of risk. I think that we, 
if we were to have multiple levels of um, risk change over time moving into the future, and I think regulation can um, accommodate that and account for that. Um, you know, if you're in a place that is is currently or is going to be high risk at some point in the near future, um, then X, Y, Z or something along those lines. But I, th I think that to keep the credibility, we have to show that the current, but I think it's also helpful to show what's happening in the future and what's predicted um, to keep the credibility. All right, thank you. The Q is Amanda, then Dave. Yeah, really quick. I don't mean for this to be a Pam and Amanda show, but um, uh, the other the other piece that I that I'd uh, just flag too is yeah, there's some predictable regrowth, but depending on where the fire burned, um, it, you know, if there's a large piece of, of federal land, you know, what land management is going to happen within that burn within that fire scar is questionable, and so. Um, you know, if we go in and, and salvage a bunch of material and then go and plant, that is going to potentially change how we predicted regrowth to happen. So I, I feel like there's too many um, unknowns as we as we grow out that um, that material. I think it's good as an education tool, like I said before, to help inform. Uh, folks that are, are trying to rebuild or new, new people that are buying land and, and are rebuilding. Um, I think that that's, I think that that's good, but I just, I'm really leaning towards um, staying consistent with all lands, how we're, how we're um, uh, uh, modeling out fire intensity and burn probability across the entire map. So um, that's just my two cents. Thanks, Amanda. Dave. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, I think Tim's question, at least the question on the table, I think is pretty straightforward. And uh, I, I'm very much supportive of the concept that we don't change uh, uh, based on events that occur in between in between remaps. I think that's the right uh, policy it, and it promotes predictability, uh, uh, which is critical given the regulatory impacts of these proposals. I also completely agree with Pam uh, and uh, uh, am nervous that uh, any model that predicts the way a burned out area is going to regrow, I think is presumptuous, uh, particularly if the burned out area contains a significant amount of private property, uh, to assume that a property owner is going to uh, is going to uh, rebuild and 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 use their property in the same manner that they did prior to the fire. Uh, I think is uh, is a nice way of of losing credibility and is probably inaccurate. Any so I'm ready to vote on on. I guess that's a long way of saying Sam. I'm ready to vote uh, on what Tim has proposed, which I think is uh, makes sense, but. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't support a, a language that does what Chris, I don't know if Chris is, is advocating for something, but to the extent that, that we add that language, that's something that I don't think we should support. Thank you. So um, here's what I think is going on and a possible suggestion for you all to consider. I think uh, the, within the four corners of that statement about when we do it, um, there's probably likely uh, agreement. I think that there are, for lack of a better term, related sub-questions and ramifications uh, to this. Some are regulatory and some um, could be based on the incentives that can come with the fund and the funding to make this better. Unless one of you um, has a um, sort of a meta proposal that includes all of these things as a package. My inclination is to give ODF and OSU a chance to take all these good comments, consider them more as a package and come back for the, uh, for the next meeting. 
but I'm going to I'm going to ask just straight up, Tim, which what what would work best for you as far as moving this process forward? And I'm happy to take a poll on just the four corners of that. What I'll call, for lack of a better term, the timing issue. I think um, you know there's a lot a lot that uh, goes into this, and I think I'm going to ask uh, get one clarifier from uh, for from the visual here from Chris yet as I go, but I'm, I'm you know, the, there's a grants that stability is important in the regulatory framework. I'm, unless I'm way off kilter here. I think that there's a, that's been a pretty well, um, a, seems to be a pretty well agreements there. And that's what the, um, the base of the recommendation is to try to do is to uh, um, try to help achieve that stability. Um, in the process and and across her that um, as we go through, so um, I'm think with uh, wrapping in and making sure we address, uh, make sure we are certain of being able to address the rest of the questions with theirs, but uh, with Pam uh, with the uh, how to frame it out and uh, taking into consideration some of the uh, the efforts, um, you know, turning. Uh, trying to put some mitigation funds in an area that was high risk before it burned. We run into that currently um, quite often in some of our um, current uh, uh, grant projects. Um, so it's not a new uh, process, but uh, the uh, just taking that into account um, and trying to uh, have a clear text answer. So the recommendation reads clearer, um, I think is, uh, is good to table it and bring it back similar to what we did with the uh, the, pre, the ones we started out with today. So we'll have, follow, just follow up the discussion with uh, where we ended up with and uh, um, get to a poll uh, for next time. Okay, I do wanna give um, uh, folks an opportunity to respond to Amanda's chat about what happened with regard to regrowth in the past QRA. So Chris, what did you do about regrowth then? Uh, you know, the, all the fuel beds and, um, and even, you know, fuels treatments that are at least documented, uh, we modify the fuel beds in accordance with those type of disturbances using very standard practices that um, are, are nationally applied uh, that the land fire program has developed. And so that is, it's constant in there. And that then does precipitate into change over time right so you're, you're only looking back you know five to ten years on the effects of a fire before it, it really is no longer part of that disturbance change dynamics that are growing so there's there's some standard processes and you can look at it and sam told me not to say it but we used to call it, it it's commonly referred to in the in the um I guess fire modeling world is as this tofu delta process, which is just the change in total fuel loading. But everybody calls it tofu tofu delta. Um, they, they've changed that name, but you can look at it in the land fire, and and it's a little hard. You know, there's there's like forty fuel models, and they all have trajectories that they go in response to various disturbances. So there's there's a lot of iterations as to what that is, but that's what's constantly driving the the background fuels of these of these modeling efforts is that my concern was just that we, we wouldn't want this to, to be that dynamic, but it doesn't, really, it doesn't really matter in the modeling side of things and how all of you see this playing out. It's, it's, it's Chris, for clarification, Chris, what we see on the screen here, that's the fuel bed taken into account with that 20 year projection of growth. Is that correct? Negative. This is 2015 fire that played out in the 2017 QRA. And this is what you see is the, the, the impacts of that fire on the fuel beds, which are, are real and, and, and obvious in, in this case. So this is, you know, essentially two years after what used to be a force that no longer is. And, and research shows that, you know, six to nine years really is a, is a, especially nine, you know, tearing towards sort of depends on how productive the forest, you, you don't see fires really reburning, if you will, because the fuel beds are so low for about that long before you really start to develop something that can burn again and become a hazard again. And, and that's reflected in like here. 
Okay, so Chris, you he actually did have to say tofu. Uh, I mean, that was just important to you. I, about, I couldn't help myself, Sam. Okay, how about red meat alpha or something else? <laughs> red meat alpha. <laughs> uh, instead. So I'm going to get Kyle in a second, but I'm not sure, Tim, that there is a consensus around the quote unquote stability, depending on how you define the term stability. And I, I'll tease that out because I'm hearing Dave say something perhaps different uh, and Amanda perhaps something different than, than that. Uh, both are agreeing that we're not gonna do this more frequently than we have, but the question becomes, do you grow this out or not? And I think uh, that, that could be used as stability, but it, it, are those terms different? So Kyle, you're up, buddy. Mm, you just, I guess I confused myself listening to that, Sam. I, <clears throat> anyway, I, it was just an observation at, to Chris's point and, and Pam and Wellstate, every, everybody else. So I'm just going to be one of those idiots that repeats things people already said. Um, mansplaining. Yeah. <laughs> oh, if it is, I don't want to do that. Um, no, I guess I was just thinking about in terms of uh, the risk and, and the balance of should we grow it out or should we not? Again, to protect the credibility and simplistic and so that people have a predictable, right? What's my, obviously the base question was originally, should we do this every five years? Absolutely, no sooner, because you might get caught halfway between an application for something and you don't want to do that and things change on you. But to recognize that the canyon, we'll just keep hammering the Canyon Creek example, right? Somebody is going to rebuild back in that spot. And technically they are in a low risk category in the first five year run, right? The, the two years prior here. That, uh, that would apply to the, to the rebuilding of it, but I think we have to give people credibility that as they stand on that, you know, burned out foundation and look around, that they would that they would make a a decision that would that would you know be reflected of the environment around them, and I can guarantee you that generationally the people who survive through these kind of events don't forget about it when you know within the five year ten year window. And I'm and I'm not saying you're wrong at all, Chris, because I'm grappling in the same way you are with how to address it in the most simplistic manner possible, probably. So um, that's just again thinking out loud. Dave, I didn't want to speak for you, but I want to make sure that we, we uh, give Tim the direction on this point. So how, oh, how uh, would you express it? Yeah, I, uh, thanks, Sam. I, I don't, uh, I think all, the only point I was trying to make is that uh, is that do we want to do this? Do we want to, re, uh, to reassess risk? Uh, between modelings, I think the answer to that, for at least for me, is no. Right. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, I think I've got I've just got some concerns with the whole concept that, as as Kyle just said, and I'm not trying to mansplain Kyle. Uh, that would uh, be that would be fun to watch, actually. Yeah. <laughs> mansplaining, mansplaining. Yeah. Uh, but you know. It, assuming that things are going going to go back to the way they were uh, as a result of a catastrophic wildfire that impacted private property owners, I think is making a, a faulty assumption. Thank you. Erica, enlighten us, please. Um, I just, uh, just bringing in some perspective from other hazards. Um, there are over and over and over again, we see that when communities are impacted by hazards and there aren't changes in policies forcing people to rebuild better, they rebuild in the same way they did before. Um, so so uh, I, I, I don't want to be too pessimistic, but um, I think we should um, should look at the at the federal flood insurance programs and and see, um, how much money is spent um, rebuilding people's homes in the same way as before uh, with, with no changes. Um, sometimes people get more, more money than their, their home is actually worth um, because they've rebuilt it multiple times. Um, so it's, I, I, I think um, when, when people's homes are, are destroyed, regardless of the hazard, 
um, it costs a lot of a lot more money to rebuild in a more robust um, manner. Uh, and and considering they just lost everything, um, they're going to rebuild in the in the in the way that they know. Um, so I don't I, again I don't want to be too pessimistic, but um, you know it's it policies have to be implemented to force rebuilding um, better and stronger. Last call on uh, takeaway comments for ODF and OSU, knowing that they'll come back um, with a more refined proposal. There'll probably be interim input opportunities so we can do what we did on vegetative fuels and wild land fuels. We'll work it offline and hope to uh, land the plane for this round. Sam, I guess I, I would say, uh, I don't know if there is, is there contention on this point at all? I mean, I, I just raised a concern I had in the modeling and if it's not a concern that matters then then we don't even address it. Yeah, I'm kind of hearing a follow-up question and it's more focused on the, the future growth. Um, more so or the grow out is what I've heard a few times. I think does right. that sure what you're, you're hearing there, Dave and Kyle around, uh, do we grow it out? Um, 20 years to show that risk or do we do it at the time? You know, as this map shows, this is the QRA with no um, fuel growth taken into account into the future. And likely I, in the next iteration, this blue blotch won't be there. It's not gonna be some major forest yet, but the blue blotch will diminish as those fields have recovered. All right, I'm suggesting you, uh, unless anyone has a Hail Mary pass that they want to make, that um, we come back and let you guys work it offline. So seeing none, uh, let's take our uh, second and final break of the day. We're ahead of schedule, so hopefully we'll get you out uh, much sooner. So please come back at 1145, 1145, and we'll come to our friend, uh, question five, should risk class thresholds set as a value or a percentage? Thanks so much. See you on the other side.
Greetings, folks. It is 1146, and I'll give you an opportunity to pop on your screens and, and get us going there. Give you 30 seconds, folks, before we get back online. All right, welcome back. Thank you for your prompt return from the break. Uh, the last substantive matter on today's agenda is question five, should the risk class thresholds be set as a value or as a percentage? There was the input opportunity summary that showed us four of you gave that uh, the ODF recommendation. Um, a one, three of you gave it a two, and one of you gave it a three. But the overall um, zen of the comments was need more information. And that's what we're going to do um, uh, next. This is an informational discussion item. It's not likely we're going to take any pulse polling, but it's simply to set the stage for this important discussion. So I'll turn it over. Uh, to ODF and OSU uh, to lead us through the, what its recommendation is, the basis for it, what it's not intending to do, and maybe answer some of the, the comments we received and the input opportunity. So take it away, please. So this is the meat and potatoes of the, uh, what was originally uh, RAC2 with the statewide fire risk. We've been, uh, previous discussions, we've been uh, talking through how does that uh, risk establishment and uh, how do we quantify it? And then at the end of quantifying the risk, we're gonna end up with a an overall bar of risk with it. There's gonna be the lowest, the low risk within the state. There's gonna be the highest spot of highest fire, risk of wildfire within the state. So, and then there's gonna be everything in between. So what uh, Senate Bill 762 directed is that there's going to be five categories that that risk is going to be split into. Uh, no risk, low, moderate, high risk, and extreme. And the top two have those, uh, you know, have those downstream effects that as well. And as we uh, looking through those, how do we break that up into uh, the risk? So there's, there's going to be uh, finite numbers that come in as we uh, get the uh, over that full spectrum, or do we splice it up into different ways of, you know, the a certain percentage of it goes into one category and another. So what uh, Chris is gonna walk us through today is a way to, to visualize some different methodologies that are established to do that and what they look like. And uh, with that, I'll uh, let Chris take it away from there. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, hopefully, I don't spring any new questions on the group. Didn't mean to do that to y'all last time, uh, no but problem. I did. So it, well, it's it's fine, Chris. It's I'll, fine. I'll own it now. Um, let me make sure my screen comes up okay. Yeah, we can see it. Can you still see this? Sam's favorite slide. This explains it all, and let's all take right. go back to that. Let's take a poll on any refinements <laughs> to that formula. 
I, I, I do like to remind everybody that we're, we're, we're the, the, the equations we're bound to, if you will. Um, and this, you know, this is just the language from the bill that, that defines us or that, that sort of derives us to, to have to have this conversation. And, and it just dawns on me, you know, these, these adjective classes, just like we see in the fire danger rating system that, that Kyle brought up um, and talking about the fire danger rating uh, earlier is, is there, there's no definition that we would all agree on or is consistent everywhere on what extreme means, what does high mean? Like there's, it's a real difficult question to settle on. And that's of course why we're here is to try to figure that out. And, and Tim mentioned that. And I, I like to put this in here just to remind us that we're bound by these equations. And what I'm gonna show you walks through this process solely for homes. And so I'll make it a little more visual, but I just wanna remind you that we're, basic, we're sticking with the methodology that uh, is used in the quantitative wildfire risk assessment, but I'm narrowing this down just to the homes and the home locations only um, in the subsequent slides as we go through this process and think about um, uh, how we might go about addressing those classifications or thresholds to get those classifications. Um, and, and this is a more visual depiction of that. Um, as noted with these maps earlier, uh, the, the, we're using the 2017 QRA data here, including the where people live uh, data set as the location of those homes. In this example that I'm showing you, we will use, of course, updated data uh, in the next round. Um, and, but this is just to depict the process as to how I um, ended up with a risk rating for each of these homes that then we have to have the discussion on thresholding and how that process goes. Just so you know, the background data that we're playing with, this is of course not gonna be the real data that we're, we're gonna use um, come next year, but this is our sort of played data set. Um, and so I took that conditional flame link map here and I translated it into conditional net value change by uh, applying these um, percentage losses or the consequences to a home at these sites. And so if the conditional flame length said that uh, it was going to be under two feet flame lengths, then there's a 25% consequence of loss. Um, and then it grades up to ultimately 100% loss expectation when you have very high flame lengths approaching the, uh, the home. And that is essentially conditional net value change in a nutshell for a single resource. In this case, just assuming the home or the, the structure is present there for this uh, example. And then multiply it by burn probability to get that expected net value change. This is the integration that we all agreed on that we wanted to do was that we want to include both flame length and burn probability in this assessment. And so this is despite being on a play data set is uh, the process that uh, we agreed on the last time that we would, we would pursue uh, with when the new data set exists. So that being said, from there, we have to decide, all right, we have this continuous data set of numbers that are going to largely look meaningless to everybody. They're going to be bound by zero all the way up to 0 0.03 as the expected net value change. And then there's very small numbers in between there. We're multiplying decimals here and you get very small numbers. Um, I didn't put these on the negative scale. So the higher numbers are gonna be the higher loss. The lower numbers are gonna be the lower loss. Uh, just keep that in mind. Um, traditionally, we just invert that and make it negative because it's intuitively makes sense. Um, and so I'm gonna show you four, four ways in which thresholding commonly happens, um, particularly in a mapping environment. And, and we can look at the consequences of those various methodologies on the classification of these homes into those various classes. And of course, we're, we're particularly keen, keyed in on that extreme and high because of the regulation requirements that come from there. Um, so everybody's gonna drift towards the red and the orange, which would be the greatest expected loss. Um, but you'll see that shift around the landscape as we look at these 
four examples. Any clarifying questions before we move on? This is setting the stage, and, but this is indicative of the process we will, we will use. All right. Hearing none at the moment, I'm gonna, we're gonna move into the, the first classification method. So here's a map here in Oregon. Maybe some of you recognize this area. I won't say it because that, that's irrelevant, but um, some of you have probably already figured it out. The red being the, what is classified as extreme risk, the orange as high risk, this lightish blue as, as moderate and into the blue. The lighter blue, which is difficult to see, you see over here um, as low risk and then internal. I, I laid these uh, actual community boundaries on here to show that there, there are housing units in here that are in within that burnable landscape um, akin to what uh, Dave Honeycutt was talking about earlier and where he, he was residing, where you're in the urban environment in an unburnable landscape you're at a no risk environment uh, here in the center of the community versus the edges. Very, this is, this is all the data from, from PNW. Now, what I did here was used, you'll read it in this uh, text on the left of this slide as quantiles. Quantiles are quartiles when there's four classes, but this is really quantile classification. So the quartile that you see on my map is the same as the quantile in this case, but you can do quantiles of any number you want. Um, so they're flexible to 5, 10, 40, 100 different classes if you want. The, the idea is basically you're dividing the data set up into equal bins of the number of features as they call it, or the number of pixels or exposed communities. And so in, in this case, the top 25% essentially of the data set is categorized in the extreme risk. The next 25% down in that high and then so forth on down to the low risk. And then there's that no risk zone. And this is the, the, the what you see in, in, in this landscape as being included within the red and orange under this classification scheme that is commonly used. This was also, um, Similar for those of you that have been around science, when you, when you see box plots as a basic summary of what uh, a data distribution might be for, for anything, this is akin to doing that and displaying that. So that's one example and how it plays out. And then I, I do have a slide at the end that brings all four of these together. A second example is more of a percentile rank. In this case, I basically took 20 quantiles, which would bend 5% of each of the, of the data distribution into each of those quantiles, and then drew these thresholds at these percentages that you see in the bottom left, just by adding up through those classes. So seven of the lower classes gets you to that 35% threshold and so forth, working through those. 5% categories that I created and bend them in this fashion. So less than 35% of the data distribution would be in the low, 35 to 60 is moderate, 60 to 85 is high risk and greater than 85 as the extreme risk. And you can see the distribution then within that same landscape of how homes are then rated on that scale. Same underlying data, different thresholding methodology. And that's really the debate we're trying to have here is how do we want to threshold these examples when we do not have precedence that says this is, this number equals this class. We are establishing that precedence through this process. So percentile rank here. Probably the most commonly used, particularly in, in, in the mapping sciences or geographic sciences, is the natural breaks classification, the Jenks classification. This is, this is a process where um, you, you establish the number of classes, which we were given as four classes. It's a statistical methodology where it looks at the means and the distributions across the data set and tries to look for means, averages that are 
separated from each other uh, when you include that variance that occurs by establishing that particular threshold. And it looks for the, the natural breaks is what they're uh, within the data distribution as the data presents itself to us. It's a process that's been around since the 70s and um, is, is very commonly applied to these processes. Um, and it's just generally natural breaks, the Jenks methodology. He was a, a, um, a, a major statistician of, and this was created back in, I think, 78. So it's been around for quite a long time and it stood the test of time as a common methodology. And you can see the resulting uh, map and distribution as it's related to these communities uh, for the extreme high, moderate, and low risk in that case. And then the last one I'm going to present, and there are others, but some of the others don't make much sense in this context, so we didn't explore those, uh, is a geometric interval classification. And you can see, you know, on, on the left, I've provided the definitions that the, the GIS provides. Um, this, is, this is somewhat similar to the natural breaks process, um, but, it, but it, it balances, a, a, it, it's not the same in that it's trying to, to balance between some of the other classifications that I haven't shown here, um, notably the equal interval, and then that quantile method that I did show um, as well as that jank. So it sort of resides in a balance amongst all three of those types of classifications um, by using this, this algorithm. That's similar to the process that Jenks does, um, uh, but not the same because it's really trying to highlight in particular some of that moderate zone. And you can see um, how that plays out within the communities here where that there, there's a lot more of that orange or high class, lower extreme class. Um, and then it, you know, it sort of pinches in a little bit on those, um, that lower class. I mean, it's just another commonly applied uh, thresholding mechanism. And if we look at the four together, this is uh, how they contrast with each other based on those methodologies. Again, we don't have a very specific, if your ENVC is 0 0.002, you're probably automatically in moderate. That that those kind of thresholds are not established uh, in any states currently, and uh, so we can't lean on those. And then it's often it's you know when when we look across other risk assessments, this is all very relative to the distribution of the data. So what we're looking at here is Oregon with respect to the home locations, um, and that data is driving many of these classification schemes. And they do have differences, as we can see here. And this is really the last slide I have. All right, All right Chris, let me ask you uh, just a couple of basic questions. The, these various ways to slice and, and dice the material that you presented here and understanding there are more. Um, these methodologies or approaches exist outside of the world of forestry, correct? I mean, they, they are used in all kinds of statistical endeavors. They're not, yes, unique. They're not unique to this. Secondly, yes, and, and you may have, you may have just said this, but I want to drive home this point if it's accurate, is that in the world of forestry, um, this is a problem or challenge of first impression in that we cannot look to, and I'm making this up, what Idaho does or Montana does or, or um, you know, US Forest does in their modeling for guidance. Is that correct? Uh, slight guidance, but certainly not threshold. If we look at a national data set, then everything's relative to what happens in Florida and what happens in California as well as here. And so it really, changes the underlying fundamental distribution of the data and what it's relevant to. So maybe this is um, an ODF question is, is what is the purpose of this exercise? I mean, you know, what, what is the, you know, so I suspect this is coming to the point where you're going to ask for guidance. Do we want to do quartiles, percentiles, jenks or geometric or 
you know, divide all these by pi and multiply by the average IQ of the rack. You know, I mean, what, what's what's the goal, uh, and and how does it, what does it do on the ground? Does it bring more areas in, or push more areas out of these various categories? So, what's the practical ramifications of this exercise or this decision point? So there's two sets, and I'm going to see Dave's question in the chat, and this will probably tie in um, as it walks through. The, the purpose of the statewide of assigning these categories at a level of statewide risk is that um, it ties in not only to those, uh, you know, where the, where the risk is uh, of wildfire in the state and trying to have that as the most uh, accurate as possible um, with the tie-ins that that also directs other portions of uh, resource allocations of either boots on the ground or dollars in instances um, to certain areas for mitigation treatments um, as uh, or emphasis for, for um, regulatory action. So that's one aspect of this at the statewide scale. Um, as it pertains to the wild and urban interface, it also adds the uh, certain areas designated as being under uh, future regulatory requirements. Um, Dave, for this exercise, what Chris has on here is that um, just to display the homes, that's the purpose of the exercise, because if we just captured all the, uh, just dropped it on all the landscape, some of those blue areas where the mountains are, we'll have color at the statewide risk map level, but this is just to focus in on showing how, you know, this, this group, we have an emphasis on um, how it applies to the wild and urban interface. So that is why uh, the example show the changes to that in person. Otherwise, we'd just be looking at a, a blob of different colors that doesn't have a designation with it. So, uh, so the purpose of this is to most accurately um, establish that and to create those breaks when we take the uh, wild, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, fire frequency and cross it with the, uh, um, with the an, um, uh, intensity, we create some really obscure values. Um, some are negative and then some shoot, and then that uh, also, uh, you know, it throws away the, it tosses the scale. So we have to recreate a scale to help align where those values go. So that's what we're looking at as we go through this. And the, um, these four methodologies that Chris presented are the ways to, to categorize that and try to have the most, the most accurate representation of where those risks lie. Um, you can see just looking at the map from my first reactions of these, the visuals, the quartiles, there's a lot of extreme in that quartiles one, but that's because it's, a, it's designated to be equal. Um, we know that some of these areas aren't necessarily equal. Um, we utilize that through uh, uh, through just our uh, wildfire uh, preparedness plans and all sort of sort of other metrics that are that uh, locally is uh, brought into our, those planning efforts and boots on the ground. So this is trying to um, at the statewide scale of reference of trying to establish something that can be representative for Oregon and uh, try to get that starting point to. Uh, um, focus this initial uh, walkthrough of the, of the resources. Okay, my next question, just to get this out there, we start off by listing the five um, uh, statutory terms, and one of them was no risk. And I don't see in the legends uh, below any of these four uh, charts, a color that represents no risk. Is that because there is no such thing as no risk, or is that because somehow we, you know, we didn't divide it into five bins versus the four that are shown on the maps? So there is a no risk category. It's the dark blue. It is dark blue. But some of this out here where you see the mountains is just that there's no presence of a home out there. So there's no risk to a home out there. When you look internally at the communities, which is why I include those in this unburnable portions of uh, the city center, you don't see fire spreading in there. Therefore, it ends up with a zero value that multiplies by anything is a zero and there's a no risk category that is present for homes 
internal of the communities, which is typical of these environments. So it is there. Okay, thank you for that. I'll now open it up for questions for clarification from uh, the rack, and then we'll move on into option generating and discussion. So questions for clarification. All right, um, let, let's move on then to, oh, Les, fire away. Sorry, I got you in mid-bite there. Mid oh, you're, you're fine. Thank you, Sam. I, I got to ask, I, I would hope everyone else has got the same thought, is uh, Dr. Dunn, what's your recommendation? I mean, wh what do you think works best for Oregon? I, I tend to think that the Jenks natural breaks is the best way to go about it. I'm sort of a, a you know, a data driven junkie, if you will. So I think it has the best statistical methods that underlie it. Um, and then even looking at the map, it seems to be the most reflective of how I would expect this to play out. Um, but that tends into the opinion stage. I think the statistical methods that underlie the, the Jenks natural breaks function well. The percentile rank has significant merit though, because it's intuitive to understand. It's easy to explain to folks. It produces a very similar map. And so there, there's some, there's some, it's tough between those two because telling somebody we use natural breaks means much less than saying, you know, you're in the top 15% of these of risk categories in the state of Oregon. And therefore we, we categorize that as high risk, extreme risk. So I'm a little bit torn between the two, but as a, um, a scientist, I tend towards the natural breaks and janks. So the cue is Tanner, then Kyle. Thanks and uh, good, well, I guess afternoon now, everybody. Um, so I apologize, I'm just catching up. Um, Sean um, had to take off and I'm, I missed part of the meeting where that kind of led up to this. Um, I just wanted to kind of pose the question. I'm definitely familiar with this, this area, the area represented on the maps. Um, it looks like there's a couple areas kind of at the Southeast. Those are Phoenix and Talent. Um, there's a lot of those areas that are mapped blue and Almeida, the Almeida fire uh, last year uh, wiped out a lot of homes and those no risk areas. So um, one of the questions I wanted to ask, and this again, I probably missed some of the conversation, but how does that get balanced? And maybe I'm just missing uh, the portion where we talked about um, what goes into these maps, um, but just wanted to pose that question, and try to catch up a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's tough. And that's that, that interface that, that uh, hopefully maybe Erica will weigh in too, where we, we transition from a wildland world perspective like we see here into a community conflagration and the lack of our ability to model fire spread through a community. Um, that is a limitation. As we think about ember casts and ember showers, we can, it, it'll constrain some of that no risk area because we do wanna account for that ember shower rind, if you will, around the community, how far it'll go in there. But we fundamentally don't capture the home to home ignition environment. We, it just does not. It's, it's actually an active area of research that Eric and I wanna do that we, we will only just be embarking on and really thinking about um, so that we can include it in the future, but it's just not part of this. Do you have a follow up Tanner? I do, uh, that's, um, thank you. Um, so, and I've, I've heard, there's kind of been a little bit of mention of Embercast and the question of um, whether structures get considered as fuels, that sort of thing. Um, so it's really interesting to see, hear you say that, Dr. Dunn. Um, so basically the technology doesn't exist to account for, you know, cause like we've got communities that are in um, a, a currently mapped wildfire risk area. Um, we know that if embers get into that, into those developments, we're gonna lose homes. Um, so it sounds like the current technology isn't able to represent and model that. Is that, is that correct? 
we will be we will generate models of the source of the ember casts as well as the receptors of those yes they are not the most robust models to date this is a phenomenon that's fairly new to our reality i guess it was common back when chicago in the 1860s and 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 those those time periods but it's something that's somewhat new to us that we're dealing with and, and playing catch up in the scientific realm to be able to capture in a better more robust fashion okay thank you appreciate it thank you kyle thanks sam um so kind of this, hmm. Jenks feels natural, right? I mean, when we're talking about minimizing differences within classes, maximizing differences between classes, that that feels like it would be uh, the appropriate way to roll out. But this stuff is so technical um, that I'm I know I'm missing elements of it. And so I was wondering, Chris, if you could tell us kind of what's the primary benefit of using a percentile rank and rank, and maybe the primary uh, unintended consequence of, of the percentile and, and the Jenks approaches, if, if those such things exist, and then maybe we can weigh those from a policy perspective. I could, I can back you up that I think Jenks is, is, is pretty good. I, you know, nothing's perfect. Jenks is maybe the, maybe could be the gold standard. I don't know the, the, the challenge with Jenks is it doesn't allow us to, to set a, a more public facing threshold that's easier for people to understand, which you get in that percentile rank. The, the, the challenge with the percentile rank is that it, it really does, and, and as it was noted here, it, it really, where you draw that line and yeah, it's, where you, the, the number of classes you use to draw those lines and where ultimately that percentile you change can, can lead to some really stark like lines between, well, potentially neighbors or something. Neighbors, yeah, right across you the street. Know, which is a little bit tough to take. And it just is, is inherent in quantile classification because it forces the same number of units in each of those quantiles they may be very far apart on a continuous distribution, but get amalgamated in there just by the nature of what quantiles do. And that creates some challenges. Um, this quartiles is obviously incorporating quite a bit of that percentile and, and does pop that extreme pretty extensively. Um, that's not surprising when you're just doing four quartiles. As I got into this and we drew different ones, you know, originally I had done a hundred quantiles and then thresholded considering those percentiles of the data, right? And then I threshold and it looked very different than it did when I did 20 here to create these percentile ranks. And that's the nature of that data trying to be forced into each of those classes, no matter what. And so it can have that stark differences. This one, I think, worked out pretty good. Um, but it takes a little bit of, you know, art behind the science. Follow up, Kyle? Well, I, yeah, no, I guess not necessarily. I'm trying to figure out what fits into a rule. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> um. In a, in, a, in a way that would be uh, durable into the future and, and make sense and executable, right? Like the whole intent of good policy is you build a foundation that survives the people and that are, that are making the decisions. And I, I'm, I'm maybe not smart enough to, to know where to go with this one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, the cue is Kerry, then Roger. You're up, Kerry. All right, well, um, this is a really hard, it's a conundrum, right? How, how does one bend? Have some inherent reservations about simply binning these classes based on how many, um, you know, basically how many ho house, houses are, are, are in a class, right? Because um, 
you know, quantiles are great as a descriptor, a good descriptive tool, but they don't have a lot of actual value. And so what I've seen used elsewhere, and this is potentially the lid of Pandora's box that I should keep shut, but mm -hmm. um, there are exceed exceedance probability curves, right? Where you can actually look at that value of expected net value change, transform it into a, you know, a likelihood of loss, right? And so then we could set thresholds based on that likelihood of loss that even couldn't be consistent among, you know, multiple iterations of the assessment. Um, you end up, you know, how, how you set that level is basically, you know, you have to ask the question is the, you know, the prob a particular probability of losing a hundred homes, is that extreme or not? Is the probability of losing 50 homes? Is that, you know, you have to work your way through that process. So exceedance probability curves are a way of looking at what does that, that um, risk really mean, acknowledging that it's a modeled value, it's pretty abstract, it's useful for, for comparing, you know, across a geography, it should not be interpreted literally. And my, that's too bad. Looks like my computer is crashing. I, if you can't hear me, that's fine. If you can, no, we can, okay. we can oh, hear you. We can, I can see you. That's awesome because I have a completely black screen. Uh-oh. Um, I said basically what I was gonna say. Um, I was proposing a different approach. Instead of, instead of chopping up the existing distribution in sort of an agnostic way, as if we don't know what those values mean, using an interpretation of, of expected net value change, look at those exceedance probability curves, and then from there set thresholds about what our society is willing to tolerate as extreme high, medium, and low. Thank you. Roger, you're up. Uh, thanks, Sam. So I guess just a question for Chris. Uh, on, the, on the percentile ranks, you the numbers you've chosen, the greater than 85, and I, I'm trying struggling to see the numbers, but it's like 60 to 85, some of that. Are those arbitrarily chosen or is that uh, based on science or where, where do you get the value? And I guess what happens if you change the 85 to 90 or to 80? Uh, obviously the colors of the map would change. So where did, where did those numbers come from? It came from Tim. For this, those numbers were, were our <laughs> things are throwing me under the bus. I, I, I just teasing Tim. <laughs> they did, but I mean, they, they're, they're reasonable numbers, but they are, they're not, you know, drop dead numbers. And it's not something you yeah. don't fall on your sword for. It was for putting together this exercise. There were five risk classes with one being no risk. We put 10% there initially you know, with, with, us, with what Chris and I were as discussion and what would fit into the model with 15 at high and that left 75% in the middle for the three other classes. That was just to get the discussion going to have visual for today. Um, so that's the, the reasoning behind where those percentiles are. And uh, you now I'm staring at the percentile rank and the and the Jenks natural breaks uh, is, is, the, is where some distributions might lie and some of the connotations between the two. So um, they're initially the basis for the recommendation, um, but the uh, from, just ODS perspective of trying to write an administrative rule that's understandable. Um, percentiles with a number are understandable, whether those, you know, those, what we have listed there, of course, need to be scientifically reasonable. Um, if I was um, reading a rule, even in my current position that said fire risk classes will be determined by the Jenks natural breaks method, I would have to really Google it and look and what that, what that means, because the rule won't tell me what that means. So that was some of the perception about keeping it simple with a percentile rank, but also making sure those ranks are, are calibrated appropriately to admit fit us uh, the conditions on the ground as well as within the statistical means um, that uh, Chris has pre presented here with the different ones of getting it um, zeroed in um, the best as possible. Again, this is just more discussion for today on a topic that seems simple at the at the high level, but is complex as we as we discuss through what goes into uh, dividing out these categories. Roger, follow up. 
I guess, you know, I guess I'd like to see what a map looks like if you took the same map and changed the number from 85 to 90 or, or back to 80 and, and see how it compares because it, it seems to me, I, I can understand both methods, but it seems like the, the natural break method kind of makes sense, is it, is it but you're, you're leaving some quantitative values in there, not just raw numbers, uh, but maybe you could get to the, and I understand Tim's, what Tim says, you got, it's easier to see a raw number in a rule. I agree with that, but you know, are those the right number? Then that becomes the discussion. Thank you, Pam. This is a lot of food for thought. I think that um, Tim's point regarding um, the percentile ranks makes a lot of sense in terms of making it understandable. Um, because I seem to have a little bit more um, trust of mathematicians. I personally lean towards the Jenks. Um, however, um, I think another point that's been made here that really strikes me is that it's important that when this is ultimately written into rule, if we want this to be really understandable and adoptable by people who are going to see their lives change as a result of this, I think it's gonna be important to be able to describe the risks um, with somewhat more nuance than merely extreme, high, moderate, et cetera. And I think it would be helpful for us even here to think about how we would make those descriptions. Not that I have any, you know, off the back of my um, napkin here, but it would be useful for us to think about how we would make those descriptions, what really is an extreme risk, and then ask the question, approximately where does that percentage number fall in order to actually um, match the description more or less that is true qualitatively. And does it, has my suggestion made sense? Um, Chris, Tim, does that, do you get what I mean? Yeah, more that you want more than just a word, you want a description of what the class might mean um, as a characteristic that someone might be able to read and visualize. Yeah, and I think that that's exactly right. I think that would help us make answer some of these questions. And I think it would help the public swallow some of these um, regulations better than keeping it nearly mathematical because I don't think everyone else likes math as much as I do. Other comments, suggestions? So uh, Chris, a couple things here. Um, Carrie, and maybe Kerry already uh, was saying this, but he asked uh, for um, a histogram. Is that what you're asking for, Kerry? Is that the substance of your conversation, Pierce, or am I just out to lunch? I don't like math. Actually, I think a histogram would be a great way to actually, instead of a map, we could have a histogram to show quartiles, percentile rank, jinx natural breaks, and geometric intervals, because all that this is doing then is, is, is chop, the, those four methods just chop up um, that histogram into different size buckets. So it actually would work better potentially than a map for thinking this stuff through, because it lets you see sort of how much of the state is being um, taken up by those different classes. Um, but my other suggestion, which feels like it should, it's kind of coming out of left field, um, is to use the exceedance probability curves, looking directly at that allocation of risk and, and setting thresholds for the probability of losing X number of houses per year as a way of setting these classes. Okay. For us and, and, you know, unfortunately, it would take more work on my part to really be articulate about that methodology. No problem. But for us, uh, math uh, neophytes, can you describe to us what a histogram is and what that looks oh, like? Oh, Chris has got it up now. This is, this okay. is the, oh, the distribution of values that are, that, that are seen across this landscape, right? And so more negative values. What do you got here, Chris? What are you actually showing? No, this is ENVC, but the higher positive is equivalent to more loss. I didn't invert the sign. 
And then this is the percentile. And so as you can see, this is not a normal distribution. There's a long tail where relatively few properties are, have that really high probability of loss. And so, yeah, those blue lines then are just showing four equal bins. Okay, so all of the observations, each, each bar is the number of observations. It, it, so there's an equal number of observations in each bin. That's what the quartile does. This, this is the percentile, so it's not quite the equal. The, I'm sorry. Um, that would be the equal number of bins. Right, so notice how the two, the two lower classes are actually pretty small when you look at the full range of possible values of the NVC. All right, thank you uh, for that. Let's go to Kyle. Uh, maybe a question for Carrie on your suggestion. Does that though lead us down the path of kind of that Andy McAvoy research where you end up, similar to that map that Chris showed us from California where density drives a lot of your outcomes more than actual burn probability and risk? No, because burn probability is already built into the calculation of the NBC. Kyle, I get what you're saying. In the, in the, the, the data set that I have here, the, the assumption for this play data set was one home with the equivalent loss for each of those pixels. So I took out that housing unit density whereby if it was, you know, if whatever, you know, 100 homes at this site, then you automatically crank up that ENVC because there's more homes. Left. Right. That's been removed out of this play data set. But that would is the case when we do exceedance probability curves, say, for a wildfire spread event. Right. And we're running FS Pro and saying if it goes this many days, we expect to accumulate this much loss. We, we do that in, for those cases. Then it is, yes, it is driven in many respects by density, hmm, but not for this case. Okay. Not that I have exceedance probability curves for this, but. Um, Chris, just again, from the lay person's perspective here, let's assume you went with Jenks, the natural breaks model. To what extent, if any, is it possible or, and or even probable or realistic to ground truth these things. I mean, you're gonna do, you know, do these statistical you know, various runs and what have you, but you know, this is, I think it was the Kyle Williams suggestion. You get someone who's across the street neighbor is differently situated for no apparent reason. Is it even, I mean, is there even the time and resources to, to I'll use my term, ground truth this to how it actually maps out? <laughs> I, I mean, I, no, no, I, I'll just say, so, you know, I, I think that's the, the, the world we're entering into as we establish these classes notify homeowners, re they respond and so forth. And then the state fire marshal's office works through their process of what needs defensible space, right? We're, we're gonna learn a lot from that. And, and we can, if, if that data is gathered along that front, we can feed that back in, but we don't have really the ability to run around to each of these homes and say, yeah, this one's extreme. If it's my opinion on what's extreme, is it yours, Sam? Is it somebody else's or this is high? It gets really, really nebulous, really fast and very subjective. And, and that's really why we need so much input on this is that certainly I can create thresholds. I do this all the time, but usually for display purposes, not for regulatory purposes. This is where it gets really challenging since we have class right. and it needs to really be something that we agree upon is the best method. I just had this flash about a, a mediation that I'm doing between the, uh, the fire marshal or the department and a homeowner. And they go back and they watch the, the recording of this tape and they find out that their house would have been, is regulated under Jenks, but wouldn't have been under 
percentile rank, and then they're going to say, you know, wait, wait, what happened here? Uh, that's not fair. I, I love geometric intervals. And <laughs> you know. uh, All right, Jim, you're up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think I mentioned it earlier about various expertise and experience around the table and how many of us might be asleep at this point after this conversation. But the basic question, or I guess the, the, maybe the solution on this is really more of an outcomes-based um, uh, finding, I guess. So I think that's ultimately the decision point on this in terms of what do you get with this? What do you get with that? In your best judgment, Chris, which one provides us um, with the outcome um, that will be workable, that will be you know, usable out there in the communities. I mean, I fully expect you're gonna end up with lines drawn, either splitting houses in half or between properties and maybe no discernible difference between them. I mean, that's gonna happen. So I think you're not gonna avoid it. So the perfection side of this thing isn't gonna be an end result for sure. So again, I'll go back to the original. Focus on the outcome of either of these and what gets you to what you need um, that will be helpful in the communities. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, la last call, in insights, suggestions. Uh, and again, obviously this is gonna be taken offline and, and more thought, there'll be another input opportunity. So we can uh, have more clarity when we go into our, our next meeting. And of course, all suggestions and thoughts are, are welcome and this send away. But any last call on this topic? So hearing none, thank you for that. Um, and um, next steps will help us move forward. Uh, it's now time for public comment. And um, I'm going to give an opportunity here for anyone, any member of the public who would like to chime in to either, if they're on the call, they can uh, go to the reaction button, which is the smiley face with a plus sign um, ab above their head. And or they can, if they're on the phone, they simply can unmute yourself. You can unmute yourself and just say, Sam, I'd like to to make a comment. So public comments. Hearing none, we'll give you an opportunity to interrupt, a free opportunity to interrupt anytime as we go into um, the next uh, agenda item, was, which is just the process check-in and uh, about how we're doing the input opportunities, the discussion protocols, and any other suggestions for process uh, improvement. Uh, Lauren, please. Yeah, hi, sorry. I figured since we're talking about process now, I had a question. Um, so moving forward, when we look at um, the poll results from something like vegetative fuels, where only 36% of the group um, voted one, but everyone else was, in either the twos or the threes, and there was a myriad of suggestions on how to get it more workable. Is that something that moving forward, um, ODF will look at some of those suggestions and see if you can get more of the group, see if you guys can get more of the group towards the one, or is it just that was, we have the discussion and we're gonna just stick with what we have, even though generally speaking as a whole, the group kind of wasn't, most people had suggestions, I guess, on how to make it a little bit more workable. So those, all the um, comments are, are reviewed. So um, we do go back into that and look at it. If there's, where's ways to improvement where we're seeing themes and, and I'm sure you've seen us come back with, a, we wanna tweak this recommendation a little bit. We wanna bring this one back. So we're gonna continue to do that. We do look through those. Um, the, as I mentioned, the, the uh, um, input opportunities, the big master list that came back, we're continually walking through that. We're changing the recommendations from what we even have on the work plan and presenting to the RAC as we go through. So um, we do take those into account where we can see themes themes in alignment. Some of them may be uh, taken where it's clear. We may uh, take those, they may come back to the group 
um, they may not. We'll just make the ad adjustments and note that when we get start getting into um, you know January, where we're looking at the full rules and you know, taking into the after the after poll comments. This is where um, we integrated that in. So we're making notes on that as we go through. Thanks. Any other process improvement suggestions? Any suggestions for improving the discussion protocol where we raise the question, the recommendation, they give you the basis, what they're not trying to do, questions for clarification, discussion, um, and polling. Any, any ways we can improve that? How about the input opportunities? I, I'm concerned that we are inundating you with these, um, these kinds of polls that are going on in the interim. And again, to be transparent, it's the only way uh, that I can think of, and I'm happy to be proven wrong, that we can get, you know, put something forward for you to push against, get your preliminary reactions, gives opportunity uh, for ODF OSU to refine, and then we bring it forward for a last look at this stage before we go into the final stage, which is actually putting words in order with definitions in an OAR. Because otherwise we'd be having those, those input opportunity discussions in real time and these meetings would just go you know, forever. But if there's other ways or suggestions to, to make this more efficient for you and be more respectful of your time while still getting uh, your input, please let us know. Pam. I wish I had a really good suggestion. I don't actually, but I do want to just um, note for the record that I think that the input responses after we've had these discussions should probably be given more weight. I know that I, for example, um, do change my perspective based on the very good comments that I hear made by most of the folks here on the rack. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. Um, Oh, yes, Amelia. I'm sorry, I was a little uh, slow to put my hand up. Um, I, I want to um, follow up with what Pam was saying, and, and I think um, something that also might help is a little more context as the question is being raised to us um, as we go into, uh, you know, if, if the department or um, whoever wants to put forward a recommendation, some, some context about why as we first receive it and then are being asked to give feedback in our initial comments. Often there's kind of a question and a and an answer without a um, as much information about like, what is really the crux of this question? What are you trying to get at? And, and where did you build your um, uh, initial kind of proposal? Because uh, we kind of end up reacting and then we come here and learn about it and then we poll at the end. And I think we could benefit from a little more understanding before we um, organize ourselves to have a position. Up front, get it more up front, focus framed up front. Karna. So building on what Amelia and Pam have said, it would also be somewhat helpful to, to know where these pieces are going to fall into the WUI. Like we're making these independent decisions and eventually this is all like you're saying, these are building blocks going into a final answer. But it would be helpful to know what part of the WUI, what part of what we're answering fits into that. Where where are we fitting in these questions? Okay, so in broader context even. Step back and give the context of if we, the result of, of question three impacts issues seven, eight, and nine, how that plays out over time um, and over the process. Thank you for that. Last call, and of course, this is not the last call. It's only the last call on this call. I mean, you can send up a flare or a candy gram or an email. Uh, Tanner. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really like the comments that were made, especially Amelia's. Um, and you brought up a good point, and I, I really appreciate the question of how, we, how can we be efficient with, um, with our time. Um, the polls and, and some of the questions I, I was thrilled at the process that was presented where uh, there's kind of this pitch, um, the landscape is set for the, for the question. Um, I like the comment of um, providing the background of the result of that, of that question is going to impact um, the overall work in this way. 
um, in that initial pitch. So kind of having that setting the, the, the landscape and um, getting some good understanding of the basis of the question, um, having the suggestion the process of, um, you know, having ODS recommendation, um, some of the technical information, kind of building that foundation, that seems to be a, a much more effective way to kind of get those initial responses. Because, um, uh, you know, our group, um, kind of Sean and I kind of went through some of these questions and um, without having that background, it was difficult to, um, uh, you know, understand the impact of the question um, and without having that additional background and suggestion, um, you know, really fully understand the question and be able to answer it effectively. So I really like the comments. I, it seems like the, the process you guys have set up where it's the meetings you guys present it, um, give the initial recommendation, we can ask some, some questions. It's much more effective um, seemingly to, to respond to those questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, the, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to uh, bring us home, and um, e either he or I can talk about what's on tap uh, for October 28th. But Tim, yep. take it away. So appreciate everyone. This is closing on a, another four-hour meeting. Um, there with, uh, today was a very technical day um, with questions, but again, these... Uh, being able to make sure that rules are understood and that we have that and they're not built in a black box, that's, uh, that's important to us. So um, that's, I appreciate you, uh, the discussions bearing, th or bearing through this and uh, the inputs and uh, gives it, make sure that, uh, um, us, uh, that ODF and OSU are, are aligned in making sure what we have in, in, the, in these rules in the end is that someone can read and understand it. That's the most important aspect of this to make sure it's effective. Um, with the combining of the rules of the uh, the process here, we'll be more uh, uh, more direct and explicit with which topics each of these questions are addressing. They're kind of intermittent a little bit to some extent. So as we uh, we uh, touched on both statewide risk mapping and wildland urban interface today, so we'll provide some more of that context to help us uh, establish the or uh, what what subject will be uh, what section of law will be uh, these will be pertaining. To. Do have a very quite a few of them have a lead in one, but have a foot in both pools. So we'll make sure where they're tied together. Um, we'll have a revision for the uh, for question six um, coming up, and uh, also the uh, the glossary will be posted this afternoon. So uh, so we'll have that on the uh, public page. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, touching base back on this uh, statewide risk questions with taken into account with uh, everything we've heard today and uh, looking at uh, revising that recommendation into something that's understandable, maybe explaining or explaining more context or being able to have a depiction or visualization that goes with each of those categories. Um, for next meeting, we're moving over to uh, the uh, more towards some of the definitions that fit towards the uh, identification and criteria of the wild and urban interface. So items like just geographic area, um, what does that mean? Um, we'll get into, that's been a, a rule that ODF has had on the books before. So that's that recommendation is that it's just a geographic area, but we wanna bring that one up. What are structures and uh, what are other human development? And then we're posing one that um, of, you know, looking forward looking and having rules that set that stand uh, for time of how to have, be forward looking with that is uh, question 11 with the uh, urban growth, uh, boundary um, inclusion or not. And that, of course, I'm expecting that we'll need some refinement for that. So um, as Sam mentioned, as these, uh, all the uh, input that we receive, we do take into account and we try to have our revisions and um, or take that into account as we prepare for the next meeting. And uh, when Chris and I review it and then uh, walk through to make sure we have those questions answered, if we see there's a there's holes in the information, we try to address them as best as possible beforehand so we can ensure that our time is spent having robust conversation um, to the best of our abilities. So we'll be back into that WUI criteria at the next meeting outside of the follow-ups from this meeting. All right, uh, thank you for that, Tim. Um, we uh, were 10 minutes ahead of schedule and I'm sure you could all use that uh, time in many ways, but for those of you who dedicated up, in, up until one o'clock for this. Uh, uh, Carrie and Chris are gonna hold an impromptu 
seminar on exceedance probability curves um, over the next 10 minutes. And for those of you who want to stay on, we're giving you continuing education credits for that as you slip effortlessly into a coma um, as we try to understand that, not because of their presentation, because of our, uh, at least my dim-wittedness. So go forth, do good, avoid evil, and we will see you on the 28th. Thanks so very much.